Yes, I do want multi-output. Yeah, let's go live. Let's do it. All right. Q1 earnings. Pretty good so far. We're going live. The tweet has been sent. Uh, yes, you will be able to listen to it on this broadcast. It is a public earnings call, so I don't believe there's many, uh, you know, issues with uh, distributing it or live streaming it myself. It's, you know, available to the public. Anybody can listen to this. If uh, you don't want to listen via um, my live stream, FYI, you can go to IR. That's it. I don't have exclusive access to things you guys don't have access to. All you have to go to is ir.tesla.com. And via that web link, you can listen to the earnings call yourself. It's, it doesn't cost anything. It's not some special exclusive access thing. Anybody can listen to it. In fact, this is actually the first time I will be live streaming my reaction and my uh, the call itself. This is the first time I'll be streaming from Starlink itself, Starlink Internet. Um, is what I'm using right now. Um, so it, there's actually a chance we could have some frame drops. It's still in the beta process, so they still say to expect little cutouts. Um, I haven't. I don't think I've done a Talos of EV live stream uh, since I've gotten Starlink. So for those who might be new to this or new watching, it's a little bumpy. But overall, when there are cutouts, they tend to come back pretty quickly. So what that essentially means is, if I, I could be live streaming or you could be listening to the earnings call via this live stream. It might start buffering, but typically not any more than like five to ten seconds. It'll jump right back. So um, it is a little bit unreliable right now, but it's gotten a lot better just in the past couple months of using it. It used to have much more frame drops than it does today. Now they're pretty minimal. Um, so it might just be a little bumpy, but I, I think overall you'll be able to hear all of the crucial information probably fine. So yeah, I'm I'm broadcasting to all of you via Starlink right now. Um, hey, Waveman Mike, how's it going? We got too many mics. Another why, Mike. Better be a snake charger update. I know. <laughs> I got my popcorn ready just for the snake charger updates. That's the main reason I'm listening in right now. It's not for Cybertruck. It's not for Tesla Semi updates. But in case you guys missed the earnings call itself, uh, not the earnings call, the earnings uh, shareholder deck. At this point, uh, they're very proud of Model 3 sales, to just kind of recap. Um, it's the best sell. It's the best selling premium sedan in the world. Um, not even four years into its launch, it's kind of hard to forget. It feels like, um, it honestly feels like Model Three has been out for a long, long time. But when you think back, it's actually not even been on the market for four years yet, and it's amazing how common the Model Three has become and how plentiful those vehicles are and how common they are, at least where I live. It's probably different for where you are. But the call starts at 2.30 p.m. Pacific, which is, if you're not in Pacific, it's uh, about 12 minutes from now. So in 12 minutes, I'll shut up, and you'll be able to hear the call from this live stream. Um, I'll play it, and I'll have a little cutaway angle. It'll look like this. Um, that's actually the picture you're looking at right now was just posted uh, from the shareholder deck. That is the updated, more modern 2021 design of the Tesla Semi. Um, this is actually from Tesla. This is not the kilowatts that has located this picture. Um, this is this is from Tesla themselves, which means the updated design is official. It's not, you know, early prototypes or that kind of thing. Um but uh, Tesla, after the shareholder deck, is still stating they expect the first Tesla semi deliveries to be at the end of this year or take place at some time in 2021. They didn't specifically send the end, but pretty much any time they say that, uh, it's it's probably safe to say uh, it's going to be near the end of this year. I hope they can stay true to that. Um, based on looking over the shareholder deck... Um, it still seems that uh, Giga Texas is absolutely prioritizing Model Y production, which, you know, it's good. We still need Model Ys and we still need 4680s ramped. I know that's the main issue, but I know there, there's probably a bunch of you guys out there really, really hoping that the next, um, you know, the, the big priority of Giga Texas would be getting the Cybertruck out, get the Cybertruck out on roads as quickly as possible. We don't have time, you know, just... How quickly can we get Cybertrucks on the road? I know. That's the way my mind thinks, and I would have much, much rather them prioritized Cybertruck production at Giga Texas. But according to the shareholder deck, as of today, that is not the case. Um, they had several photos of Giga Texas. I'm trying to think of an easy way to show them to you. I have the broadcast in the chat and everything open, so it's, it's kind of difficult to just do it. You know what? I'll just bring it up on the iPad here. Um, they had lots of pictures of the Giga Texas facility, internal... Um, pictures as well as you can see right here so second floor lots of steel going in um, but they label all of these pictures as um, 
Model Y Factory. So next to Gigafactory Texas, it's like Model Y Factory, Model Y Factory, Model Y Factory Construction. So there's other than the status of um, vehicle production right now, there is essentially no mention of the Cybertruck anywhere on the shareholder deck. Um, they didn't. They didn't provide any updates on Cybertruck timeline, Cybertruck batteries, or construction. You know, none of that, other than the traditional little chart that says, you know, Cybertruck is in development for Giga Texas. Oh, this is the chart I was looking for. This I don't believe has changed since the last shareholder deck. It is still Model Y is under construction for Berlin and Texas. Um, Texas also has uh, Cybertruck, but it's listed as in development, which is not the same stage as construction which essentially means that none of the construction process necessary to get Cybertruck off the ground has begun yet, um, which is not a, not a very exciting uh, development because I know this whole channel is basically just Cybertruck fans, <laughs> including myself. Their plot twist, yeah, they're building Cybertruck on Mars. That's, that's what it's going to end up being. Um, again, I don't have exclusive access. The, these you can all find via ir.tesla.com. That's investor relations. So all of this stuff is public. It's not you don't have to have an account or anything special. Um, but they were profitable. Um, they did have a, a good quarter by the looks of it. It even appears that they have sold some of their Bitcoin. Not all of it, but a portion of their Bitcoin was sold. I'm guessing based on the rise value of Bitcoin, they thought it would be smarter to um, sell a bit more of their uh crypto assets and uh, convert it into direct cash. Um, so they did that. Uh, they were still profitable. Uh, also, solar deployments were very, very high. Um, the highest they've been in around two and a half years. I believe it says 92. Yeah. Solar deployments reached 92 megawatts in quarter one, which is very, very strong. And roof deployments grew nine times compared to last year. Um, they're also seeing a lot of strength in their used Tesla vehicle business. So a lot more people, these are uh, used Tesla vehicle sales. Um, they're guessing based on Q1's performance how well 2021 will do as a whole. But essentially, Tesla is making a lot of money off of their used vehicles these days as well, which is good to see. Um, there was a little frame drop there. You don't have to remind me. I can see it. OBS lets me know. But yeah, Starlink was just looking for a satellite, so that'll happen on occasion, as long as you can hear me. Um, but yeah, the, the biggest outlook to get excited for, I would assume, is... Uh, in the Outlook page, which is page 10, it says, We are currently building Model Y capacity at Berlin and Texas and remain on track to start production and deliveries from each location in 2021. Gigafactory Shanghai will continue to expand further over time, and Tesla Semi deliveries will also begin in 2021. So that's the official update probably most of us are excited for. Um yeah, they did increase the cost of the solar, but they're now bundling it with Powerwall um, because it allows them to bypass a lot more of the uh, permit registration process of activating a system. I, I've read into this a little bit, but I'm not super clear on how to explain it. Um, essentially, Powerwalls have tremendous demand and not enough production capacity, and they reaffirmed that in the shareholder deck. So lots and lots of people are ordering Powerwalls, and they cannot they cannot make them fast enough. So the way they're combating this is they are now bundling Powerwall and Tesla Solar into a single purchase. You you can't get Powerwall separately from your solar anymore. Um, just because they figured, okay, we can't build enough Powerwalls. We're li we have limited production with Powerwalls. Instead, let's just bundle them with uh, the Tesla Solar. That way, um, Tesla Solar goes, d Tesla Solar deployments can be a lot faster now because there's less uh, permits and there's less uh, registrations they have to worry about when they're putting in a solar and battery system um, compared to doing all of that stuff separately to attach it directly to the grid. And that allows them to prioritize power walls to anybody who buys solar. So, yes, solar as a whole gets more expensive technically, but. Um, the, the deal, the value of it as a whole, I think, goes up quite a bit. Um, and yeah, in the shareholder letter, they said Model S refresh deliveries should be very soon. So they didn't they didn't specify much. They didn't go into much detail on whether or not, you know, it'll be tomorrow or next week or the next two months. But something interesting here, I did not see a lot of people talking about, but a few people brought this up on Twitter. Earnings call starts in five minutes. I'll, but also keep in mind, Tesla is almost always late on these things. So... 
it's probably going to be putting us on hold at the phone call sound effect for a while. Um, something did change with the Model S order page, which I found was interesting. I didn't see too many people talking about this. You guys can find this yourself if you go to um, the Model S configurator. If you go to Model S long range, it now says estimated delivery August or September. So there must be just a ton of orders for the Model S, and that's why they're pushing back deliveries very, very far. But here's the interesting part. So this is the refresh Model S page. If you select the Plaid variant, not Plaid Plus, but just Plaid, estimated delivery goes to June, July. So it appears that either there's tremendously less demand for the Plaid Model S, and that's why the estimated delivery is up sooner, or Tesla is just primarily optimizing their assembly line for the Plaid Model S first, and that's that's what the main priority is with production. And this, they're kind of like, eh, less important, but we mainly want to get the Plaid S out. In my opinion, it's probably the former. I think that Tesla likely has a huge number of orders for the Model S, and most people probably don't really care that much about the Plaid, I'm guessing. I know some do, but the majority of orders, people that are willing to drop 80 grand versus 120 grand, you know, it's a pretty big price gap between those two. I'm guessing there's a lot more people uh, wanting to order the long range variant and not the Plaid variant. And that's why estimated deliveries have been pushed back so far. Plaid Plus estimated deliveries have not changed in case, in case you were curious. Estimated deliveries for Plaid Plus are still mid-2022. That bums me out because that's pretty much over a year from now. So I'm I'm not excited that we're going to have to wait that long for the 4680s. But if those 4680s get to prioritize Cybertruck or, you know, even Model Y with in, improved chemistry and insanely good range, I guess that makes sense. Um, I would rather 4680s go towards more practical vehicles that are more affordable than uh, prioritize, you know, than going towards high performance, extremely fast sedan. I'm like, okay, you know, do we really need more of those? I don't know, but um, I'm going to make sure I can join the call real quick. Uh, they're just asking for my name and stuff. Company name, I'm going to say Talos. If you can put anything there though. So, oh, you can't actually watch it directly on YouTube. I sense a sneeze incoming. So hold, hold tight for that. Yep, okay. I can hear the music. I'm going to mute it on OBS so I don't get copyright claimed. And once they start talking, I will shut up and cut to the earnings call page and you guys will be able to listen in. Hopefully it works okay. Um, hopefully, potentially, for those who don't know, they do t sometimes drop somewhat big nuggets of information at these earnings calls based on what questions are asked. And there are oftentimes like... They will not say something in the shareholder deck, but then they actually say something on the earnings call. Like, Giga Texas was not unveiled through the shareholder deck, which is what we have right now. Um, all they said in the shareholder deck was, like, the next Giga Factory location has been chosen. And then on the earnings call, that's when they were like, okay, it's Giga Texas, by the way. So it could be something like that. Maybe they have more detailed estimates on semi-deliveries or Cybertruck timeline. They could have that type of info or the what's actually more likely, those are kind of wild cards right now, but Tesla has been talking a lot about full self-driving and the rollout of version 9 and the beta button. And it's, in my opinion, quite possible they could unveil the subscription price at this earnings call. I don't know another good time to unveil that um, other than just a tweet or just a website. You know, they just update it. Oh, by the way, you can subscribe to FSD for this much. But uh, if they are going to launch it, and they want it to be a publicly known thing, doing it during the earnings call would make a whole lot of sense to me. So Plaid Plus is mid-2022, then is Roadster pushing back to 2023? Hard to know. It's safe to say Roadster is very much not a big priority for them right now because it doesn't necessarily help them accelerate their mission. <laughs> they want to work on getting, you know, Model Y 4680s out, and then Cybertruck, and then Semi, well, not in that order. Probably Semi coming first and then Cybertruck and then Plaid Plus Model S and then, yeah, probably Roadster at the end of all that. So it could be end of 2022 for all we know. Um, I expect FSD beta button could be unveiled next week. I hope so. We've been saying next week for several months now. <laughs> um, now Electric in the chat says, I'm from Germany and it looks like Giga Berlin will be delayed because of our enormous bureaucracy and because waste... Water management isn't made yet at all, but I hope Model Y deliveries will start 2021. Sounds like they still will. I I personally believe they will. 
I know that there could be some government holdups, but I would be very shocked uh, personally. Oh, they're talking. They're saying standby. Yep, more music. Okay, so nothing. it hasn't officially started yet, but they basically just came on the phone and said, we're not ready yet, give us a minute. <laughs> Once they actually officially start talking, I'll, I'll shut up and you guys will be able to hear it. Um, typically, Tesla is late with this stuff. That is, that is common. Remember how late they were at the Cybertruck unveil? And the Model Y unveil. And Battery Day. Pretty much everything they do is just a little bit late. <laughs> That's kind of the theme they have. Um... But yeah, I, I don't I don't think Giga Berlin will be that late. It it might not be June. It might get pushed back till September, October, but I'd be very shocked if it got pushed back till next year. Um I hope that the beta button comes soon, although I'm not sure that's something they're gonna talk about on the call. Long term solar plus power wall should allow Tesla to do virtual power plant energy buying slash selling. Oh yeah, no, it's a it's a very smart move. It kind of sucks for the people that were trying to get Tesla solar for they're saying. Yep, they're still saying standby. I can hear them, but I don't want to play the call right now just because it's playing music and I've gotten claimed by that. So that's why I'm not sharing it, but once they start talking, I'll share the audio. Um, if, if someone was trying to get Tesla solar for as cheap as possible, bundling the power wall with Tesla solar makes the whole package more expensive. So that's a bit of a turnoff for some budget friendly people, but I understand Tesla's viewpoint. You know, they, they just want to make sure that they prioritize power wall deliveries to people who are buying solar directly from them. That way they can roll out, uh, and deploy solar panels a lot faster and they can make good use of their systems that they're already manufacturing so um giga berlin is a huge disappointment for me as a german huge embarrassment for Germany. <laughs> i don't i don't think it's a reason to be embarrassed you'll, you'll get your next generation paint shop and all that uh very very soon so don't don't get too bummed out by it i'm sure you're going to get great range great build quality solid vehicles coming out of berlin and you'll probably get the model 2 before we do in the u.s that's my guess What's going on here? Uh, any minute, Tesla's going to start their Q1 earnings call. Do you think they will show new Cybertruck picks? Well, it's a call, so no. <laughs> it's an earnings call, like over the phone. So I don't see them showing picks. If they wanted to show pictures of something, they would have put it in the shareholder deck. That's how we got the Model S refresh, was through the shareholder deck, and we didn't get any new Cybertruck picks. But Elon did say to expect a Cybertruck update in Q2. We're about a month in. Still nothing, but you know he also said we'd get uh, Cybertruck updates in November and December, and we didn't get that. So, oh, they're saying it'll begin momentarily. Still music, man. They're really pushing it today. Um, wouldn't it be nice if no one's talking about Cybertruck because the update is tonight? That would be nice, but I don't think that's what's going to happen. <laughs> If they wanted if they wanted to do the Cybertruck update, I'm pretty sure they would put it in the shareholder deck. <laughs> I that's when I would expect it at least. Will you be making a recap video when it's over? Um if they announce some bombshells of like some big deals like Cybertruck update is coming here, this is how many Tesla semis we're gonna make, and also here's the FSD beta subscription. Like if they announce a bunch of big stuff, I'll do a recap video, but Last few earnings calls have not really had that many big bombshells. It's typically just been like, yeah, it's it's like what we said in the shareholder deck. You know, it's good, good profits. Model Y doing good. Shanghai good. And if it's just kind of repeating stuff, we already know. I don't really plan on doing a recap video for that. But I'll, I'll be live. I'll talk about it here on the live stream for a bit. Uh, we're still waiting for Model S and X call. Uh, yeah, they did say in the shareholder deck S deliveries would be very soon. I'll play it live here. Yeah, you'll be able to hear it on my stream. But I am live, for those who don't know, via Starlink. And Starlink is still in beta. So there there are occasional dropouts. If I start buffering or I start freezing up a little bit, it'll typically fix itself in just a couple seconds. It shouldn't take very long. Um, but you can still listen to the call yourself uh, via ir.tesla.com. It's available to anybody to listen to there. But I'll be in the chat. 
and uh, I'll be talking about I'll be talking about um, what they talk about on the earnings call right after it ends. I'll still be live, so you're welcome to listen here. Starlink seems to be somewhat steady so far, so I think we'll be okay. I think it's starting. Whoa! Wow. Five minutes late. They're still saying not ready yet. I'm listening to it right now. They're like, eh, please stand by. Thank you for your patience. Uh, where are you using Starlink? I'd love to give you a precise measurement, Andy, but people have tried to track down my location before. And because of that, I've chosen to keep my location anonymous. Sorry. <laughs> I would l I would love to share that, but people abuse that information too much. Close to where all the other Starlink beta people are. <laughs> Not that far. Justin says Cybertruck no handles. Yeah, that's uh, the latest update we've gotten from Elon is that it won't have door handles. On a scale from 1 to 10, how much do you desire a cyber semi? I don't think a cyber semi would necessarily be a good idea just because the main battle you're having with the semi truck is not durability. It's more about weight. How heavy is the truck itself? Because the weight of the truck impacts... Um, sorry, the music stopped and I was like, are they starting? And then it started playing again. Um, oh, it's, I think it's starting. I'll shut up. Here we go. After the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star zero. I will now hand the conference over to your speaker today, Martin Vieca, Senior Director of Investor Relations. Uh, thank you, Carmen, and good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Tesla's first quarter 2021 Q&A webcast. I'm joined today by Elon Musk, Zachary Kirkhorn, and a number of other executives. Our Q1 results were announced at about 1 p.m. Pacific time in the update deck we published at the same link as this webcast. During this call, we will discuss our business outlook and make forward-looking statements. These comments are based on our predictions and expectations as of today. Actual events or results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent filings with the SEC. During the question and answer portion of today's call, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Please press star one now if you would like to join the question queue. But before we jump into Q&A, Elon has some opening remarks. Elon? Uh, great, thank you. Uh, so <clears throat> Q1 2021 was a record quarter on many levels. Uh, Tesla achieved uh, record production, deliveries, and surpassed a billion dollars in non-gap non net income for the first time. Uh, and we've seen a real shift in customer perception of electric vehicles, uh, and our demand is the best we've, we've ever seen. So this is, um, to be totally frank, we've, we're used to seeing a reduction in demand in the first quarter, uh, and we saw an increase in demand. Uh, this is, that, that exceeded the, the normal uh, seasonal uh, reduction in demand in Q1. Um, so um, Model 3 became the best-selling mid-sized premium sedan uh, in the world. In fact, I should say the, the best-selling uh, luxury sedan of any kind uh, in the world. The, the BMW 3 Series was for the longest time the best-selling premium sedan. Uh, it's been exceeded by the Tesla Model 3. And this is only three and a half years into production and with just two factories. Um, for Model 3 to be out, outselling its combustion engine competitors, I think this is quite remarkable. In the past couple of quarters, we delivered uh, roughly a quarter million Model 3s, so, uh, that, which translates to an annualized rate of half a million per year. Uh, when it comes to, to Model Y, uh, we think Model Y will be the best-selling car or vehicle of any kind in the world, um, and probably next year. So um, I'm not 100% certain next year, but I think it's, it's quite likely. I'd say more likely than not that in 2022, Model Y is the best-selling car or truck of any kind in the world. Uh, then um, with regard to full self-driving, uh, full self-driving beta continues to make uh, great progress. But this is definitely one of the, I think one of the, the hardest technical problems that exists, uh, that's maybe ever existed. And uh, really in order to solve it, 
we, we basically need to solve a pretty significant part of, of artificial intelligence, of specifically real world artificial intelligence. Um, and that, that, AI, that, that sort of AI, the, the neural nets needs to be compressed into a, a fairly small computer, a, a very efficient computer that we've designed, but nonetheless, you know, a small computer that's using on the order of 70 or 80 watts. Um, so this is, I think, a much harder problem than if you were to use, say, you know, 10,000 computers in a, in a server room or something like that. Uh, this, this has got to fit into a smaller brain. Um, and uh, the, this, I think with, with the elimination of radar, we, we, we're finally getting rid of one of the, the last um, crutches. Radar was really, uh, it, it, it was making up for some of the shortfalls of vision, but this is not good. You actually just need vision to work. And when vision works, it works. It, it, it works better than the best human. Um, it's like having eight cameras. It's like having eyes in the back of your head, the sides of your head, and and, and three eyes at different focal distances looking forward. Um, this is, yeah, um, and, and processing it at a speed that is superhuman. This, this I, I, there's no there's no question in my mind that uh, with a pure vision solution, uh, we can make a car that is dramatically safer than uh, the average person. So. But, but it is a hard problem because we are actually solving something quite fundamental about artificial intelligence. We're, 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 we basically have to solve real world vision or AI. Um, and we are. So, um, and key, key to solving this is also having just a massive data set. So um, just having um, well over a million cars on the road uh, that, are, that are collecting data from uh, very sort of corner case rare situations, um, you know, sort of like a, so many weird things in the world, like 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 a you know a, a truck carrying a truck, uh, or um, you know a um, you know, a car with a, with a one example is a, a car, an actual example, a car with a kayak on the roof where the kayak has a little uh, a little weight dangling from the front of the kayak in front of the car um and and yet the car must ignore this uh and just just look at the road um so it, it's really quite quite tricky um but i am i am highly confident that we will get this done so yes uh this, this quarter, and I think we'll continue to see that a, a little bit in Q2 and Q3. Uh, this, so Q, Q1 was, was had some of the most difficult supply chain challenges that we've ever experienced in the life of Tesla. Um, insane difficulties with, uh, with supply chains, uh, with, with parts of, of over the whole range of parts. Um, obviously, people have heard about the, the, the chip shortage. This is a, this is a huge problem. Um, but then, you know, in, in addition to that, for, for example, we we, um, uh, we had quite a bit of difficulty scale, scaling driving our production in China um, uh, because we were unable to get uh, critical engineers there because of, of COVID quarantine restrictions. So, uh, which meant that Tesla worldwide was dependent on drive units. Uh, made at our factory in Nevada, Gig Nevada. Um, so that that was a very challenging situation. I think we're mostly out of that particular problem. But that's just those just two of, of many uh, challenges. So the team has really did done an incredible job of dealing with uh, really severe supply chain shortages. Um, so let's see, with respect to the Model S and X, um, there there were more challenges than expected in uh, developing the uh, Plaid Model S, or what's called the, the Palladium program, um, which is the, the new version of Model S and X, which has a revised interior um, and a new battery pack and new drive units uh, and new internal electronics. Um, 
and, and has, for example, a, a PlayStation 5 level uh, infotainment system. Um, there's just a, a lot of a lot of issues encountered. Um, ensuring that the new factory was as well super safe was, was quite hard as we're making more energy in a smaller space. Uh, so it took quite a bit of uh, of uh, development to ensure that the battery of, of the new SX uh, is safe. Um, and, and we're trying to get get all the details. In the cars slowly uh, for the past few months, but we're we're just stacking them up in the yard and um, and, and and just making refinements to the cars that we built. Um, but we do expect um, to ramp uh, Model S production and start delivering them probably uh, next month. Um, so um, and, and then to be in sort of fairly high volume production for the S in, in Q3 uh, and to start delivering the Model X in Q3 as well. So um, I think as we, as we ramp up, I think probably the demand for the new SX will be quite high. Um, so it's really just gonna be a question of ramping supply chain and in, internal production processes. So probably, oh, we're, we're, like we're, we're gonna aim to produce over 2000 SX per week, um, perhaps, you know, if, if we get lucky, upwards of, of 2,400 or 2,500. Um, this, this, again, is contingent on global supply chain issues, which are just a lot of factors outside of our control here. But but I, I do think we, these things will get sold, so it's just a matter of time, and, and then we'll be doing well over 2,000 uh, SX per week. Um, and it's, it's a great car. It, it actually costs us less to produce, a little bit less to produce. Um, but it is a, a superior product. So in conclusion, there's, there's a lot to be excited about in 2021 and 22. Um, we're building factories as quickly, quickly as we can. Uh, both Texas and Berlin are, are progressing well. And we expect to have um, initial limited production from those factories this year uh, and volume production from Texas and Berlin next year. Um, at the same time, we're continuing to ramp production of Model Y in Fremont uh, in Shanghai. In the background, we're continuing work, development work on the semi, Cybertruck, uh, the Roadster, and other products. Uh, thanks uh, to everyone at Tesla who made this here a huge success. Uh, now, on to questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some remarks from Zachary Kirkhorn as well. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Thanks, Elon. So congratulations to the Tesla team on breaking multiple records in the first quarter of 21, as Elon had mentioned, which is typically the most difficult of the year for many reasons. To summarize the quarter, I think it's best understood by three key items. First, we successfully launched and began the ramp of Model Y in Shanghai, achieving positive gross margin in the first quarter of production and receiving a great reception from the market. Second, as Elon mentioned, although we began the production process for the Model S during the quarter, we had not yet begun customer deliveries. The reduction in Model S and X deliveries from Q4 to Q1 were a meaningful headwind to free cash flows and profit generation. For example, we incurred an estimated $200 million of direct P&L impact relating to this program in Q1, the majority of which is reflected in COGS and that's before even considering the impact of lost revenue and profits as a result of the transition. And as, he mentioned, as Elon mentioned, we expect the first deliveries to begin shortly. Third, as we continue to work through the instability of the global supply chain, particularly around semiconductors and port capacities, while the Tesla team in partnership with our suppliers did tremendous work keeping our factories running, we did experience high expedite costs in the quarter and they were also higher than they were in Q4 with some minor interruptions to production over the course of the quarter. But we believe that this landscape is improving, but it does remain difficult and it's an evolving situation. If we double click uh, within net income, auto gross margin excluding credits improves sequentially and year over year. This is in spite of the cost mentions for SNX and expedites and a reduction in global ASPs 
as our cost structure as a company is reducing at an even faster pace. So as we look out over the course of the year, we feel optimistic about our gross margin strength, uh, particularly as some of these headwinds we're experiencing start to be resolved. On services and other margins, these have recovered and are trending towards profitability, aided by strength in the used car business, operational improvements in service, and additional service revenue opportunities that help absorb fixed overheads. On energy gross margins, these remained negative for a second quarter. This is driven by solar roof-related ramp costs and winter seasonality in the lease BPA business. Uh, we continue to manage through a multi-quarter backlog on Powerwall. We're working as fast as we can to increase production, and this will aid in profitability of this business as those volumes increase. Uh, on operating expenses, these increased for Q1, uh, which is driven by our investments in technology and growth. In particular, for R&D, this includes the structural battery pack and 4680 cells, uh, investments in the new SNX, and um, our neural net and silicon investments. On the SG&A side, we're setting up infrastructure and support for both China and EMEA in anticipation of volume to come there. And as I've said before, our plans show that we remain on track for sustained industry-leading operating margins. Uh, Double-clicking on, on cash flows, we continue to generate positive free cash flows, and this was despite the significant working capital headwinds from SNX. Additionally, we are making progress reducing various forms of debt. We also invested $1.5 billion in Bitcoin during the quarter, then trimmed our position by 10%, which contributed to a small gain in our Q1 financials. Taking a step back, we've generated $8 billion in operating cash flows and $4 billion in free cash flows over the past four quarters. As we look forward, uh, our plans remain unchanged for long-term growth of 50% annually, and we believe we're on track to exceed that this year as we guided to last quarter. Uh, global demand remains meaningfully higher than production levels, and so we're driving as, as fast as we can to increase our production rates. You know, as we think about Q2 and Q3, these quarters should largely be driven by execution on SNX, as we've discussed, continued ramp of Model Y in Shanghai, and the associated cost reductions of these programs. Um, and we expect profitability and cash generation to evolve over the course of the year in line with those improvements. And then as we get towards the end of the year, our story will pivot towards the launch and ramp of our newest factories in Austin and Berlin. So there's cer certainly no shortage of exciting things for us to work on and look forward to. Uh, thank you, and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much. And we'll first take retail questions from uh, Say uh, website. The first question is, how is Dojo coming along? Could Dojo unlock an AWS-like business line for Tesla over the next few years? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. So, you know, with with respect to Jojo, Actually, sorry, sorry, that guy. My apologies, I was on mute. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Elon. Um, so, um, yeah, I was just basically saying that uh, the it, although, like right now, people think of Tesla as a lot of people think Tesla is a car company or perhaps an energy company. Um, I think long term, people will think of Tesla as much as an AI robotics company as we are a car company or an energy company. Um, I think we are developing one of the strongest hardware and software AI teams in the world. Um, certainly, we, we, we appear to be, just, be able to do uh, things with full self-driving that, that others uh, cannot. So, um, and if you look at the evolution of, uh, our, of what technologies we developed, um, we developed them in order to solve the problem of self-driving. So we, we we couldn't find a powerful enough neural net and burns a computer, so we designed and and built our own. Um, the the software out there was 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 uh, really quite primitive for this task. And so we built a team from scratch um, and um, and have been developing 
what we think is probably the most advanced real world uh, AI in the world. Um, and then it sort of makes sense that this is kind of what needs to happen because the, the road system is designed for a neural net computer, our brain. Our brain is a neural net computer. Uh, and it's designed, the, the entire road system is designed for vision with, neural, with a neural net computer, which is because it's designed for eyes in a brain. Um, and so if you have a system which has very good eyes, uh, you can see in all directions at once, you can see three focal points ahead or forward, uh, but it never gets tired. It's never t sort of texting. Um, it has redundancy um, and its reaction time is superhuman, then it seems pretty obvious that, that such a system would achieve an extremely high level of safety far in excess of the average person. So that's, that's what, what, we're, what we're doing. Um, then Dojo is kind of the training part of that. So um, because we're, it, we're, we have over a million cars and perhaps you know, next year we'll have two million cars in active use, um, providing vast amounts of video training data that then needs to be digested by, by a very powerful training system. And currently, we use uh, it's Tesla training software. So we have a lot of we develop a lot of training software, uh, a lot of uh, labeling software to do um, so to be able to do uh, surround video labeling, uh, which is quite tricky. Um, this means all eight cameras simultaneously at 36 frames a second per camera, uh, labeling video over time. Um, there wasn't any tool that existed for this, so we developed our own labeling tool. Then taking it a step further, obviously the, you know, the, the holy grail is auto labeling. So now we're, we're getting quite good at auto labeling where we do, we do, where, where the, the trainers train the training system um, and, and then the system auto labels the, the data and, and then the, the label, the human labels just need to look at the labeling to confirm that it is correct and perhaps make edits. And then every time an edit is made, that further trains the system. So it's kind of like a flywheel that's just sort of spinning up. Um, and really the only way to do this is with vast amounts of video data. Um, so then we need to train this efficiently. So Dojo is really a, uh, it, it is a supercomputer optimized for neural net training. Um, we think Dojo will be probably an order of magnitude more efficient on, a, on say, I'm not sure what the exact right metric is, but say per frame of video, uh, we think it'll be an order of magnitude more cost efficient in hardware and in uh, energy usage per frame of video compared to a GPU based solution or compared to the next best solution that we're aware of. Um, so then, then, you know, possibly that could be used by others. Um, it does seem as though over time, I mean, just as just an observation, I think basically just a fact that um, neural net-based computing or you know, you know uh, AI-based computing is a more and more of the compute stack. Um, we, we, conventional computing, computing is called perhaps heuristics-based uh, uh, computing, um, is still going to be important, still going to be very important, um, but uh, it, it, it will become, but, but neural net will become a, a bigger and bigger portion of, um, of compute. Uh, so anyway, um, that was a long story, but I think, yeah, probably others will want to use it too, and we'll make it available. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the second question from uh, retail investors. Uh, the recent price changes on solar roof have been discouraging uh, for customers and investors. Could Tesla share more about solar roof challenges uh, and if uh, the outlook has, uh, has changed at all, uh, i.e. 1,000 uh, roofs per week? Yeah, first of all, I should say that the, the, 
demand for the solar roof remains strong. So despite uh, raising the price, the demand is still um, significantly in excess of our ability to uh, to meet the demand to to install the solar roofs. So production is going fine, but but we are choked at the installation point. Um, we we did find that we we basically made some significant mistakes in uh, in assessing the difficulty of certain roofs, but the complexity of roofs varies dramatically. Some roofs are to be literally two or three times easier than other roofs. Um, so you just can't have a one size fits all situation. Uh, if a roof has a lot of protuberances, um, or if the roof or, or if the roof uh, sort of uh, the core structure of the roof uh, is uh, is rotted out or is not not strong enough to hold the solar roof, uh, then the the costs can be two or can be double, sometimes three times uh, what we what our initial quotes were. Um, so in, in those cases, what we obviously offer to do is to you know, refund customers their deposit. Um, uh, and uh, but, but what we cannot do is is go and, and just lose a massive amount of money. Um, we, we just got to provide a refund of the of the deposit. Um, but but perhaps what is um, I think most important about the solar situation, which I tweeted about you know, this past week, is that we're shifting the whole uh, the whole sort of solar situation, so the solar power, basically solar plus battery situation to there's only one product, basically, or there's, there's only one one configuration. Every house, we, we, we will not sell a house solar without a power wall. Um, the, that solar could either be solar retrofit, you know, with conventional panels put on a roof, or it can be the Tesla solar glass roof. Uh, but in all cases, it will have the power wall too. Technically, this, this is it's actually power wall to a plus, if you will. Um, the, the plus refers to a higher peak power capability. Um, so uh, basically all power walls made since roughly November of last year uh, have um, a lot more peak power capability than, uh, than, than, than the specification on the website. Um, the, it, it, they have rough, about twice the the, the power capability, roughly. It depends on how you count power, but uh, about twice the about twice the, the, the peak power, and about you know, arguably twice the the, the steady state power of, of the specification of the website. The energy is the same, but the power is, is roughly double. Um, and uh, all installations, uh, so all installations will have the power wall, and the uh, the difficulty of the installation will will dramatically increase, or the, the difficulty of the, the, the installation will will be will be much less. It'll be much easier because uh, the the power from this from the solar roof, solar glass roof, or the the solar panels will only ever go to directly into the power wall, and the power wall will only ever go between the utility mains, or between the utility and the and the the main power panel of the, of the house, uh, which means you never need to touch the main circuit breakers of the house. You never need to touch the house circuit breakers. Effectively, almost every house therefore looks the same electrically instead of being a unique work of art and requiring uh, exceptional um, ability to rewire the main panel. So, uh, this is extremely important for scalability. It's the only way to do it, really. Um, and this also means that that every uh, solar power wall installation, the the the, the house or farm or whatever the case may be, uh, will be will be its own utility. And so even if all the lights go out in the neighborhood, you will still have power. So that that gives people energy security. Um, and we can also in working with the utilities, uh, use the power walls to, to stabilize the overall grid. So let's say that there's a, uh, like if there was in Texas, there was there was a, a peak power demand. And, and that peak power demand, because the grid uh, lacked the ability to buffer the power, uh, they had to shut down power. 
that, that there's no power, no power storage, no, no good, no good form of power storage. However, with a whole bunch of, of power walls at houses, um, we can actually buffer the the the, the power. So, uh, if, so if if the grid needs more power, we can actually then, um, with the consent obviously of the homeowner and the, and and a partnership with the utility, uh, we we can then actually uh, release power onto the grid to take care of uh, peak power demands. So if effectively, the power walls can operate as a giant distributed utility. This is profound. I'm not sure how many people will actually understand this, but this is extremely profound and necessary because we are headed towards a world where, uh, as, as we were just talking about earlier, where people are moving towards electric vehicles. This will mean that the, the power needs uh, in, in at homes and businesses will increase significantly. We will there will need to be a bunch more electricity coming somewhere. Um, in fact, if you go to full full renew, renewable electricity, we need about three times as much electricity as we currently have. It, it, that, so uh, we, we, these are rough numbers, but you roughly need twice it, roughly need twice as much electricity. If, if, if all transport goes electric, and then you need three times as much electricity if all heating goes electric. So basically, this is a prosperous future, I think both for, for Tesla and for the utilities. Because, and, and in fact, I think this will, this will be very, if, if this is not done, the utilities will fail to serve their customers. They won't be able to do it. They won't be able to react fast enough. Um, and we're gonna see more and more of, of what we see, see in California and Texas, of of, of uh, people seeing brownouts and blackouts, and the utilities not being able to respond because the, because of the, there's a massive change going on with the transition to electric transport, and we're seeing more extreme weather, weather events. This is a recipe for disaster. Uh, so it is very important uh, to have uh, solar and batteries at the at the local level at the house. Uh, in addition, it is important to have uh, large battery storage at the utility level um, so that uh, solar and wind, which are the main forms of renewable electricity, uh, can be, that electricity can be stored because sometimes the wind doesn't blow, um, sometimes it blows a lot, uh, sometimes it blows too much and sometimes it doesn't blow enough. Uh, but if you have a battery, you can store the energy and provide it, the energy to the grid as needed. The same goes for solar because obviously the sun does not shine at night uh, and sometimes it is very cloudy. And so uh, by having uh, battery storage paired with solar and wind, this is the long-term solution to a sustainable energy future. Um, and as I said, this, this really needs to occur both at the local level and at the utility level. It, it, the, if, if it doesn't occur at the, at the local level, what will actually be required is a, a massive increase in power lines, uh, in uh, power plants, so they have to put long distance, long distance and local power lines all over the place. They'll have to increase the size of the substations. Uh, it's a nightmare. This must occur. This, there, there must be solar plus battery. It's the only way. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and the next retail question is, Master of Coin, can you tell us anything about Tesla's future plans in digital currency space? or when any such major developments might be revealed. Sure, thanks Martin. Um, so uh, as I noted in our opening remarks and we've announced previously, so Tesla did um, invest 1.5 billion into Bitcoin in Q1 and then we subsequently sold a 10% stake in that. We also allow customers to make uh, de vehicle deposits and final vehicle uh, purchases using Bitcoin. And so where our, our Bitcoin story began, maybe just to share a little of the context here, um, Elon and I were looking for a place to store cash that wasn't being immediately used, uh, try to get some level of return on this, but also preserve liquidity. You know, particularly as we look forward to the launch of Austin and Berlin and uncertainty that's happening with semiconductors and uh, port capacity, being able to access our cash very quickly is super important to us right now. And, you know, there, there aren't many traditional opportunities to do this, or at least that we found and in talking to others that we could get good feedback on, particularly with yields being so low and without taking 
on additional risk or sacrificing liquidity. And, um, and Bitcoin seemed at the time, and, and so far has proven to be uh, a good decision, uh, a good place to place some of our cash that's not immediately being used for daily operations or, or maybe not needed till the end of the year and um, be able to get some return on that. And, you know, I, I think one of the key points that I want to make about our experiences in the digital currency space is that there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic here. You know, we're certainly watching it very closely at Tesla, watching how the market develops, listening to what our customers are saying. But, you know, thinking about it from a corporate treasury perspective, we've been quite pleased with how much liquidity there is in, in the Bitcoin market. So our, our ability to build our first position happened very quickly. Uh, when we did the sale later in March, we also were able to execute on that very quickly. And so as we think about kind of global liquidity for the business and risk management, uh, being able to get cash in and out of the markets is something that I think is exceptionally important for us. So we do believe long term in the value of Bitcoin. So it is our intent to hold what we have long term and continue to accumulate Bitcoin from uh, transactions from our customers as they purchase vehicles. You know, specifically with respect to things we may do, you know, th there are things that we're constantly discussing. We're not planning to make any announcements here. And we're watching this space closely. So when we're ready to make an announcement on this front, if there's one to come, you know, we'll certainly let you all know. Thank you. Um, and the fourth question from uh, retail investors is, uh, does Tesla have any proactive plans to tackle mainstream media's imminent, massive, and uh, deceptive uh, clickbait headline uh, campaigns on safety of autopilot or FSD, uh, perhaps specialty PR job of some sort? Uh, well, uh, I can, I'll take this one, guys. From, from the safety side, I continue to say, uh, say if you want to he is driving yeah. point and all. Go ahead, Elon. I know. I think if, 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 please go ahead. Uh, if I think it's just worth just uh, going through the facts of the uh, what uh, I mean. Specifically, there were, there were uh, there was an article regarding um, a, a tragedy where, where uh, there was a high-speed accident in, in Tesla that uh, and there was re really just um, extremely deceptive. Uh, media practice, practices where it was claimed to be autopilot, where this is completely false. Uh, and those journalists should be ashamed of themselves. Uh, please go ahead, Lars. Yeah, thanks, Elon. So uh, I was just saying we're, we're committed to safety in all our designs, and that's, you know, number one in what we do here. Um, regarding the crash in Houston specifically, we work directly with uh, the local authorities, NTSB and NHTSA, wherever applicable, and whenever they reach out to us for help directly on the engineering level and whatever else we can support. Um, in that vein, we did a, a, a study with them uh, over the past week um, to understand what happened in that particular crash. And what we've learned from that uh, effort was that auto steer did not and could not engage on the road condition that, uh, as it was designed. Uh, our adaptive cruise control only engaged when a driver was buckled in above five miles per hour. Um, and it only accelerated to 30 miles per hour over the distance um, uh, before the car crashed. Um, as well, uh, adaptive cruise control disengaged the car slowly to complete to a stop uh, when the driver's seatbelt was unbuckled. Through further investigation of the vehicle and the uh, accident remains, um, we inspected the car with NTSB and NHTSA and the local police and were able to find that the steering wheel was indeed deformed, so there must, leading to the likelihood that someone was in the driver, driver's seat at the time of the crash, and all seatbelts post-crash were found to be unbuckled. Um, we were unable to recover the data from the the, uh, data, uh, the SD card at the time of impact, but the local authorities are working on doing that, and we await their report. Um, as I said, we, we continue to hold safety in a high regard and, 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 and um, look to improve our products in the future uh, through this kind of data and other uh, information from the field. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the next question from institutional investors. Uh, the first question is, uh, proponents of alternative grid storage technologies claim that lithium ion is unsuited for long-term storage at scale due to vampire drain. Could 4680 uh, cells address this limitation? 
Is the limitation even relevant <laughs> for charging the energy equation? Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, just let me yep. jump in on the vampire drain. Yeah. drain. That's definitely not the issue. A uh, good uh, lithium ion cell self discharges less than 0.001% of its energy per day. So it, it has the vampire drain is maybe a non sequitur. A myth. No. Yeah. <laughs> as, as mythical as vampires. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. I think the challenge with seasonal storage is your value proposition drops from hundreds of useful full cycles per day, per year to less than maybe 10 or maybe even less than five cycles per year. Um, so it's just a different type of technology, you know, altogether that would make sense, given that it's more than an order of magnitude different use case. Yeah. I mean, we've got a long way to go before we're dealing with seasonal technology uh, issues. Um, but, but certainly a way to deal with seasonal technology uh, would be to um, have uh, wind and solar um, growing on the side of more, more southerly latitudes. Um, and and uh, but, but then across uh, a variety of longitudes. So essentially... Like let's say in the U.S., for example, if there was, uh, you know, I'm not sure if people understand that you you can actually power the entire United States with just sort of a hundred, roughly a a hundred mile by hundred mile grid of solar. Um, sometimes people don't don't quite understand like, well, how much solar is needed to power the United States? Almost almost nothing of the of the the substance is required to power the United States. And this is true of of almost a, any country in the world. Um, the solar incidence is a gigawatt per square kilometer. This is insane. Uh, in fact, if you took the clear area, just the, the area uh, for, say, for nuclear power plants, the area that is considered not usable uh, because a nuclear power plant is there, in most cases, if you just put solar there, it would generate more power than in, in the nuclear power plant. This is because they typically have pretty wide clear areas um so uh, it really so, so and um if you have say 25 percent efficient solar panels um and and then those are 80 percent efficient in, in how they're laid out you're going to do about 200 megawatts per square kilometer uh this is, this is, therefore you know five square kilometers is a gigawatt which might be a, a typical sort of power plant um it, it's really not much area at all and a lot of places can have wind and solar same place so um anyway it's, it's entirely possible to power all of earth with a small percentage of earth's area um, and then to transmit that power uh through um high voltage dc lines no new technology no no uh you don't need like um you know, room temperature superconductors. This is a total, also another myth. Room temperature superconductors, uh, almost irrelevant in my opinion, almost irrelevant. <laughs> um, low cost, long distance power lines using copper uh, or aluminum or just, very important. Um, so heating is I squared R. So that's current squared time, times resistance. So as you increase voltage, uh, you can drop the current dramatically and drop the heating dramatically to the point where it is uh, of, of minor relevance. Like maybe you lose 5 to 7% uh, with a high voltage DC power line, something like that. Um, so I want to be clear, no new physics is necessary, no new materials is necessary. We just need to scale this thing up. We have, the technologies exist today to, to solve renewable energy. And some of people say, well, why don't we do it? That's because the energy basis of the Earth is gigantic, super mega, insanely gigantic. So you can't just go and do a zillion terawatts overnight. You've got to build the, the production capacity for the cells, uh, for the battery cells, for the solar cells. You've got to put that into vehicles. You've got to put that into stationary storage packs. You've got to put that into solar panels and solar glass roofs. And you've got to deploy all this thing, all, all this stuff. But, but it is certainly the case that we can accelerate 
this. Um, and we should try to accelerate it. Um, and uh, the, the, the right thing to do, I think, from an economic standpoint, and I think almost any economist would agree, is to have a common tax, um, just as we have a tax on um, cigarettes and alcohol, uh, which we think are more likely to be bad than good, and we, we tend to tax fruit, fruit and vegetables less, well, the same should be true. We should, we should tax energy that we think is probably bad and support energy we think is probably good, just like cigarettes and alcohol versus fruits and vegetables. Um, it's just common sense. Um, and, uh, you know, but I guess on the plus side, I'm not suggesting anyone be complacent, but sustainable energy, renewable energy will be sold. It is being sold but it matters how fast we solve it. And if we solve it faster, that's better for the world. Thank you very much. And, and well, there's, there's, no, there's no question in my mind whatsoever that the energy storage problem can be solved with lithium-ion batteries. Zero. I want to be clear. Zero. Um, I, I think the bias will tend to be uh, towards um, iron-based uh, looking at the cells. When people say looking at mine, people think looking must be a, a, a big constituent of the cells. It, it's, it's more like one to two percent of the cell is lithium. Um, the, the, the main part of the cell is the cathode. The, the main mass and cost in the cell is the cathode. For high energy uh, cells, um, like for example, we, what we use in most uh, most houses have, have nickel-based lithium ion cells which have higher energy density, longer range than iron-based cells. However, for stationary storage, uh, the energy density is not as important because um, it's just sitting on the ground. And so uh, I think the vast majority of stationary storage will be uh, iron, iron-based um, lithium-ion cells with an iron, cap, iron, uh, iron phosphate cathode technically. But I think the phosphate part is unnecessary. It's really just iron or nickel. Um, unnecessary in the terminology. I just, just think of it as iron or nickel. Uh, and this, there's an, an insane amount of iron in the world. Uh, more iron than we could possibly use. Uh, and there's also more lithium than we could possibly use. Basically, there is no shortage of anything whatsoever in iron phosphate lithium ion cells. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the next question uh, from institutional investors, which is, uh, you've suggested that between a, a 5x to 10x improvement is achievable in the automotive production versus the uh, uh, versus the first Model 3 line on the first uh, principles physics analysis. Uh, where does Berlin sit? Where does Berlin sit relative to that limit? Oh, I, I think we're still, we're still quite far away from it. Um, I mean, the, the thing to bear in mind with with production is, uh, for those who have not, who've never done production, they just don't understand how insanely hard production is. Um, I, I, I want to really be very, very emphatic here. Prototypes are trivial. They're child's play. Production is hard. It is very hard. Now you say production at, at, at very at large scale with higher liability and low cost, insanely difficult. What, what Tesla achieved on the automotive side was not to create an electric car. The, the truly profound thing on the, on the car side is that Tesla was the first American car company to achieve volume production of a car in 100 years and not go bankrupt. So this is, the, the, this, this I basically myself and many others at Tesla had to basically have several aneurysms to get this done. It was it was so hard, you have no idea. So anyway, and, and the thing about making a large complex manufactured object is, let's say you have first order approximation, ten thousand unique items. If even one of those items is slow, that sets your weight. Just one. Doesn't matter how it can be so trivial. We've we've had uh, production production stop because of carpet in the trunk. We had production stop because of a USB cable. At one point, for the model, the we literally 
integrated global supply chain, um, 50 countries, uh, dozens of regulatory regimes. Um, it's insane. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and the last question from institutional investor is um, Master Plan uh, Part 2 talks about an urban transport vehicle that is smaller than traditional bus with greater uh, aerial density achieved by removing the central aisle. Do you have any updates to share on this goal? Not at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so let's uh, uh, move to analyst Q&A. Thank you. First question is from Pierre Ferrago with New Street Research. Your line is open. Uh, hi, guys. Thanks a lot for taking my question. Um, I'd love to get actually an update on what you, you presented on the battery day. Uh, in the last six, seven months, I, won't, I was wondering how much progress you've made uh, on that front, first in terms of process development. So how are things coming together on your pilot line? Are you getting to the kind of... Uh, production throughput you were aiming for, and, and second, actually, on your production ramp. So I was wondering in, in which sites you're ramping production capacity for the, the 4680 cell, uh, and, and where you stand uh, on, uh, on ramping up that capacity as well. And I'll have a quick follow-up on energy as well, if that's possible. Well, um, so we, we have the, uh, I'm sure if you add to this, but, uh, we, we have the, the, the a small sort of pilot plant, which is still big by normal standards. Expect to have like a 10 gigawatt per year, gigawatt hour per year capability uh, in um, Fremont, California. Um, and uh, we, we've made quite a few cells. Um, we're not we're not quite yet at the point where we think the cells are re reliable enough to be shipped in cars. Um, but we're getting close to that point, um, and um, and then we're, we're, we've already, uh, you know, uh, ordered um, most of the equipment for battery production uh, in Berlin, uh, and uh, and then and, and then much of it for Austin as well. Um, so we're, we're really down to like the nitty gritty elements. Um, but overall, I think we still feel quite optimistic about uh, this achieving volume production of the 4680 next year. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just one thing I would add is there's been a lot of questions about uh, yield. Actually, I noticed people asking about that, and uh, you know, the yield progress has been really strong uh, every day. When we were really still in commissioning phase, we were really still in commissioning phase with most of the tools. Uh, to the point where we're confident that the yield trajectory aligns with our internal cost projections. Um, we did talk about yield also at Battery Day, which is one of the reasons why it's, it's useful to check in on that. Um, you know, it takes a while, as Elon just mentioned, to go from uh, prototype to production, and it's not just parts, it's processes, it's equipment. Um, but as we've matured those pieces of the process, the process equipment, we've we've gotten to where we need to be on on the yield side. Yeah, and basically, it, it, this is just a guess because we don't know for sure, but it appears as though we are about 12, that they're probably not more than 18 months away from volume production of the, of the 4680. Um, now, at the same time, we, we are actually trying to uh, have our, our sales supply uh, partners uh, ramp up their supply as much as possible. So this is not... Uh, something that is to the exclusion of suppliers it is in, in conjunction with suppliers um so yeah we're you know we're we want to be super clear about that this is not about replacing suppliers it is about supplementing uh the suppliers so um we have a very strong partnership with with catl with panasonic and lg um and we would our request to our um strategic partners for cell supply is Please make as uh, please supply us with as as much as you possibly can. Um, pro provided the, the price is affordable, we will buy uh, everything that they can make. Yeah, yeah, and 
specific to that, we've, we're on track to more than double the supplier capacity over the next 13. Yeah, we, we, we exactly. We, we do expect from suppliers willing to receive double the cell output next year versus this year. Yep. Okay. And I had a quick follow-up on um, um, maybe Zach for you on your energy business. So I understand uh, like the negative gross margin with uh, solar roof uh, RAM, but I was wondering, you know, what do gross margin look like there when you look at the storage business and where you, your, what's your ambition in terms of gross margin in a, uh, in that business, as I guess it's going to grow uh, to grow in the mix in uh, in coming years. So it's uh, it's important for long term modeling. Yeah, we're we're seeing yeah. a lot of. Oh. Uh, uh, we're aiming for comparable margins in storage as in as in vehicle, um, but but it is important to bear in mind that vehicle is more mature than the storage, so. Uh, we, we already are at good margins with the power wall, um, but some additional work is needed for the mega pack to achieve good margins. Yeah, Drew, what do you think? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, sorry, just jumping in, Elon. Absolutely agree. Yeah, uh, power wall is mature. We've been producing power wall two for three years now, and and we're at good margins there. But mega pack has more room to go to achieve our targets. So we have a we have a clear runway for improving the the cost for the megawatt hour of the mega pack. Absolutely, yes, we do. Thank you. Let's go to the next question, please. From Rod from Rod Lackey with Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, I was hoping maybe just first you could talk a little bit about um, how you're thinking about the rollout of version nine of FSD and. Uh, the transition to the subscription model. It sounds like some some of this is about to roll out next month. I'm not sure if that's the subscription model, but uh, maybe you could just uh, spend a little time talking about how impactful you, you expect that to be. So go go ahead, guys. Yeah, we're working on. Um, getting FSD subscription out. And th there's a couple of internal technical dependencies, but from a business model perspective, that's aligned. And uh, we're hoping to roll that out soon. The, the key thing that I say here, um, th there's a lot of potential for recurring revenue based on an FSD subscription. Um, the, the, if you look at the size of our fleet and you look at the number of customers uh, who did not purchase FSD up front or on a lease and maybe want to experiment with FSD, is a great option for them. Um, you know, one of the things we'll need to keep an eye on is a potential transition from cash purchases of FSD subscription over to or cash purchases of FSD who may move over to FSD subscription. And so there could be a period of time in which you know cash reduces in the near term, and then as the portfolio of subscription customers builds up, then that becomes um, a pretty strong business for us over time. Uh, but we're hoping to get this launched pretty soon and um, and see what the response is to it. Okay, uh, great. And I um, was hoping, Zach, maybe you could just talk a little bit about OPEX. Um, there was a noticeable increase, e even excluding uh, SBC. Uh, obviously, a lot going on this quarter. But can you maybe just talk a little bit about how we should be thinking about that uh, going forward? Sure. Um, on the R&D side, you know, what we're seeing, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, is um, kind of a convergence of a series of programs that are happening. And, and our R&D OPEX spend kind of correlates to where we are in the product life cycle on different programs. And so we're, you know, kind of at the tail end of investments in uh, what we call internally Palladium, which is the new Model S and Model X. And, uh, and so we expect that to decrease over time, but uh, it was high in Q1. Uh, for a lot of the reasons that Elon had mentioned. You know, we're also getting very heavy into 4680 development that Drew and team are working on and the associated structural battery pack that goes along with that. And so these are new technologies, uh, not only new to Tesla, but new to the industry. And so we're investing heavily there on an R&D side to work out those kinks. 
and you know spend along along in those areas you know should continue over time as we continue to work through the development cycle of those um and then I also mentioned you know Elon talked a bit about you know dojo and the and the potential there so from neural net investments and custom silicon investments, these continue to be areas that we spend on and make investments in. Um, on the SG&A side, uh, you know, the business is pivoting very quickly to be global, and uh, China is ramping quite quickly. And, and we're trying to uh, make sure that we are staying ahead of the volume so that we have the right sales capacity, store capacity there, uh, local investments in IT and others to manage the growth, such that as the growth comes, the execution challenges are smaller than maybe in similar periods of growth that we've seen in the past. And uh, and so we're making investments there ahead of the growth. And, and overall, as we look at OPEX as a percentage of revenue over the course of the year, we do expect to see a substantial drop from 2020 to 2021 as the volumes in the latter part of the year pick up. Thank you. Let's go to the next question, please. Thank you from Dan Levy with Credit Suisse. Your line is open. Hi. Uh, good evening. Thanks. Um, two, two questions. Uh, one is, is on COGS. I think we've gotten from Battery Day a pretty good feel about the potential for COGS reduction related to powertrain, but I'd like to get a sense of the path to reducing COGS X powertrain is uh, you'd still need a meaningful reduction on that front uh, to make the math work on a $25,000 vehicle. So what levers do you have to reducing your cost X powertrain? Is it just more scale, better supplier pricing, or is it just based on ongoing cost reductions? Uh, sure. I mean, I think uh, all the above. Yeah, I mean, on, on the on the vehicle side, there's plenty of opportunity as well. Obviously, building a car like a Model S is quite complex and has various moving parts. Model 3 and Model Y were steps of improvement in that. But when you look at some of the other advancements that we're including in the Model Y factories into Austin and Berlin, uh, we've reduced the body part count by as much as 60% and the part cost money. So um, we continue to find optimizations there as well as we get economies of scale. When we start to talk about the volumes, we're considering worldwide with four factories building the same vehicle. Um, so both of those things uh, on the vehicle side will improve our COGS as well, and, and the powertrain continues to be integrated into that. Great. And then just related, you know, as we see uh, Berlin and, and Austin ramp, I'd, I'd like to just get a sense on the comparison of Fremont versus the new capacity. Obviously, Fremont non-optimized because you – bought, uh, you know, the old NUMI facility, you had to retrofit that to your needs. So maybe you can give us a sense of how uh, your new capacity is going to differ versus Fremont. What are the areas that you have efficiencies that you previously didn't have? And maybe, you know, how much does that add up to uh, improved COGS uh, over time to help you achieve that $25,000 vehicle? Uh yeah, I don't think we, we don't want to talk too much about um, future product development. Uh, the, the, the earnings calls are not not the right place for um, yeah, to make 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 major product announcements. So it's, yeah, we, we, we'll get there, but we'll we'll talk about it later. All right. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for dialing in and for listening, and we'll speak to you again in about three months. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect. All right. They just wrapped up. Uh, they just did it. Seemed they were pretty closed off. Um, it's just playing music now. Yeah, it just ended. Okay. Um, Seems like they were pretty closed off at unveiling too much. I'm very sorry if you were hoping for any type of timeline on Cybertruck updates or Roadster updates uh, or much detailed explanation on Semi. Um, by the looks of it, they wanted to remain as incredibly vague as possible with the rollout of everything. I mean, um, 
they did. They had an incredible quarter. That's the main takeaway here, and I think that that's ultimately the purpose of these earnings calls to re to remind yourselves of is that it's it's more about talking so much about today. And like Elon was just saying, they don't want to reveal a bunch of stuff via earnings calls. They have there have been things they've unveiled via earnings calls, but um, when it comes to the products, uh, not so much. Um, but yeah, they uh, they mainly were talking about how 4680s have made some good progress with higher yields, but they don't expect volume production to take much longer than 18 months, uh, or 12 to 18 months is what they said. So it could be, it, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly what volume production means in that case. Um, in regards to what volume could be, I still believe that there will be some vehicles with 4680s driving around by the end of this year, most likely the ones from Berlin. Uh, those are high on the list. Um, and if we're lucky, there's a good chance, uh, you know, 4680s could be on Model Ys coming out of Texas by the end of this year. Texas is making amazing progress. It's just all that progress is going straight towards Model Y production, not Cybertruck production. So I feel like the two, the only chance of 4680s coming out in vehicles this year, it's most likely going to be Model Ys either in... Um, Europe or Texas, and I'm very confused and concerned on how Tesla's going to have 468. This is a question I wish someone would have asked. <laughs> um, I have a big list of questions I would love to ask, but there's so many people trying to ask, and uh, I'm you know just a guy in sweatpants, so they probably aren't going to prioritize me. <laughs> but the question I wish we could have gotten answered was something like, um, if 4680 Model Ys are coming out of Texas, um, and you're also mass producing Model Ys out of Fremont, how are these vehicles that are using drastically different battery technologies and manufacturing techniques going to coexist with each other? Are you going to have, you know, obviously there's going to be a time when some Model Ys are coming from Texas and some Model Ys are coming from Fremont. How do you diversify those two? How do you separate them so not everybody wants the Texas made Model Y and no one wants the Fremont made Model Y? You know, how can those two very different manufacturing lines coexist with each other? That's something I feel like it's not too big of a question to, you know, some of these questions are crazy because they assume that Elon's going to unveil some crazy products during the earnings call, like, you know, where is the van? What is the van going to be called? What's the van design? And how, what's the range going to be? And how much, you know, they're not going to do some big crazy unveiling like that. Um, oh, sorry, I lowered the bit rate uh, during the call because I didn't want there to be as many frame drops. I'm just going to raise it a bit so I look slightly more creep, uh, slightly more crispy. Um, Plaid Plus is what matters. <laughs> not, not really. I mean, Plaid Plus is cool, but it's it doesn't in regards to accelerating the transition of sustainable energy. Plaid Plus is not super high on the priority list. Um, I think there's a reason they put estimated deliveries to mid 2022 on the Plaid Plus. Um, SNX would really show people that Tesla is still on top and no one is even near them. I feel like if people aren't convinced of that now, they're not ever going to be. <laughs> vehicle deliveries and vehicle production and in the, in the rate of the factory construction, I think, is what proves that more than anything. If people still can't see that and they need a fancy car to prove them that Tesla's on top, I don't I don't think we need to win those people over. That's okay. Um, rain, range matters, but if it's range on a $150,000 vehicle, no one's going to care. That's not going to change much. <laughs> You know, having a great range on a vehicle no one can afford isn't going to change anything. Um, those doors, though, in the yoke. Yeah, I agree. It's a great car. I'm just meaning it doesn't really change much. Uh, I might be on the market uh, early 2022, so I hope 4680s are coming from Berlin by then. I think, um, I don't know if they'll have batteries coming out of Berlin by that time, but they will most likely have um, vehicles coming out by next year for sure. I, I could still see it being late Q3, Q4 at this point. Um, Plaid Plus is the frosting on the cake. Roadster is the sprinkles. <laughs> yes. I like the diversification of the desserts. Um, but all car makers need an unbeatable flagship. Kind of, but it, it becomes more of a flexing thing. It's like, yeah, you might win over some of the media and you might get some branding applause, but that doesn't really change... I'm glad that Tesla has a very clear mission of accelerating sustainable energy, which involves making more affordable, practical vehicles um, and understanding that range is not everything. 
um, it's a it's an adequate balance of of range and affordability. You know, like I bet Tesla right now, even without forty six eighties, they could probably make a six hundred mile range version of the Model S, but it will cost you know two hundred three hundred thousand dollars. Okay, the range is great. All right, that's amazing. There's an insanely good range, but if no one can afford it, it doesn't really make a difference. So <laughs> that's a slip and a half. I don't know why I was gonna say creepy, but crispy. That's what I. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> Autonomous sweatpants. Um, let's see. Said that Plaid is delayed even more. Well, yeah, I mean, we should be getting first deliveries within the month. Um, <laughs> although this is on Elon time, if the Model S refresh is kind of turning into the full self-driving software. It's like it keeps getting pushed back and pushed back. So based on the earnings call, it sounds like Model S production ended up being a tad more complicated than they thought. Um, so first deliveries have not begun. So that's a big reminder to all the people. When, when I did my video called Model S is delayed, there were all these people saying, Someone already got delivery or someone on a podcast said someone took delivery of one. And I was like, no, that's not, <laughs> that doesn't count. If someone claims they've had a delivery, it doesn't mean a delivery's begun. And now Tesla themselves are saying deliveries haven't started yet. So I don't think those people hold much credibility. Um, but yeah, he he did say probably sometime in May is when first deliveries will begin. Um, they've been piling up in the uh, Fremont factory. Of course, we've been see seeing them. Me and Model Y Mike um, ha actually saw a refreshed Model S at a supercharger at the Fremont factory. So um, we got to see it pretty close. The guy inside the car didn't really want to talk, and um, he wasn't very welcoming at the idea of us checking it out. But either way, we know they exist. We know they're driving around and they're testing them and they're prototyping them, but uh, getting to the point of official deliveries... Um, is hopefully just a few weeks away. The earnings report said very soon. We're very close to the first deliveries, but I'm guessing that means Model X uh, deliveries are also probably not going to be until the third quarter. So don't get too pumped for Model X being right around the corner. Um, Model, Tail would, Model 2 would sell incredibly well here in Germany. That's the biggest section of the market here. Oh yeah, I bet pretty much any market the Model 2 is in. Any type of electric vehicle that's made by Tesla so you know it's going to have autonomous driving features and cool software and futuristic interior you know that that's already as we've proven most of the time demand goes down in quarter 1 compared to quarter 4 but that was the amazing thing about this earnings call is they said that demand actually increased in quarter 1 and the Model 3 has become the top selling premium sedan in the world electric or not electric um, so they have an insane amount of demand just for being who they are, which is, you know, Tesla and being modern and minimalistic with their interior. So if you just suddenly made something that you could still brand as a Tesla and still have that minimalistic interior and that futuristic design, and it's now, it's still got a range over 200 miles, but it's more affordable and it starts purchase price below $30,000. Yeah, that thing's going to sell like crazy. I don't care what market it's in, whether it be Germany, Shanghai, America, I, I can't imagine a market where that wouldn't sell well. <laughs> I guess a market maybe where not that many people buy cars, but, you know, that's probably not where the Model 2 is heading. But um, I don't think that's why we need Plan Plus. Um, won't just be Germany. Yeah. If the 4680 cell cells are still 18 months out, based on what I thought heard from Elon, what do you think the Texas Model Y will have 4680s? He said volume production. He didn't say the batteries themselves are 18 months away. He said, for one, he said 12 to 18 months away from volume. Um, we're just not entirely sure what he means by volume. Um, in other words, like, obviously most 4680s will be delivered in volume in the future. That makes sense. You're not going to have the bulk of your volume now in less volume later. That doesn't make sense. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I still think... Um, all the Model Ys coming out of Berlin are probably going to be 4680s. Same with Texas. It's just not going to be in super high volume at first. Low volume 4680s. Um, let's see. If Mercedes EQS is clearly the best EV ever made, people won't see Tesla on the forefront of car makers, even if Model 3 and Y beat every car in their price range. I don't think a lot of people see it that way, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people that saw the Mercedes EQS and just completely despised that design. And... Um, 
we're not as into the interior as much as maybe a Tesla, but it's it's I think you're oversimplifying the market a little bit too much. Um I I don't think we need to prioritize the six figure vehicles. I think prioritizing battery production and affordable vehicles is probably where the bulk of the money is. Um Tesla needs to focus on accelerating sustainable energy, not uh flexing who has the best range. Uh, or who has the most premium interior. I don't think that's the big priority. Um, if EQS can make a great car that a lot of people like, but they can't mass produce them as much as Tesla can, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't accelerate much if you can't mass produce it. Um, did they discuss any specific successes in producing and testing 4680s? Not too specific, but they did say that the yields have been improving a lot. And... Um, Right now, they're not confident enough in 4680s to start putting them in cars, but they did say they're getting close. So how close we are is up for debate, but they did say that, yeah, that they're, they're getting close to being ready to start shipping them in cars. But um, volume production, still 12 to 18 months away. So most of that happening next year. Um, my reserved Cybertruck won't pass literally through some of our streets here. Still want it, though. <laughs> I want a car I can't fit anywhere. Rivian is going to have a sizable jump on Tesla if Cybertruck does not enter the market soon. I agree. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I brought up in my whole Rivian R1T video is that they will be on the market for quite some time. But Rivian is still uh, battery constrained and production constrained. The CEO, RJ, mentioned that himself, that they they still plan on being severely backordered with suppliers and reservations for the next three years basically and they also have a huge order to fill with amazon so all the spare batteries rivian is going to get are probably going to go towards delivery vans for amazon and that could very easily bottleneck r1t and r1s production um, because that's just a handful of people putting down reservations and by handful i mean about you know 30 40 000 people have put down reservations whereas amazon has put down a giant reservation for a hundred thousand delivery trucks so they're going to be battery constrained too but yeah the rivian is definitely going to be on the market for i think quite some time before the cybertruck hearing what they said about the 4680s today does make me wonder if the cybertruck might be very late not only will it not be early it might be insanely it might be significantly late <laughs> it might it might be like second half of 2022 based on how they're describing when volume production of 4680s is going to be but i liked what elon talked about with lithium ion batteries and that it th there's not an issue with the battery itself um because that appears to be a very common theory or speculation in the battery world is that oh we haven't cracked the battery yet we need to come up with the right type of battery and the right chemistry and we got to move away from lithium or we got to try some other you know solid state or whatever you can think of there's all kinds of bs in the battery world but there's a lot of people that just think that we need to find the right chemistry and we need to find the right battery type and then we can crack the code. But Elon's like, there's nothing wrong with the battery itself. It has nothing to do with the degradation or the energy. It has everything to do with the scalability and how many you can make and how fast you can make them. Um, so they've got the prototype design down. And now the struggle is, of course, just figuring out how we can mass produce enough of these things. Um, scalability. That's the main challenge. It's not about the chemistry. Um they have to be careful with 4680s. After all, if they put cars out with faulty batteries, you end up undoing everything you've done to create a reputation for your brand and EVs in general. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's that's essentially what's going on right now. I mean, there were a few people leaking or suggesting uh, that Tesla has put 4680s into prototype vehicles. So obviously they wouldn't talk about that but um, because that's not a customer vehicle. But there's lots of 4680s being produced at the Cato Road facility. I don't think they're just putting them into boxes. I think that they're probably putting some of them into cars and testing them and seeing how they age and making sure that if there are any significant overheating or fire issues with them, that they find them internally, not when they are found in vehicles. So they're doing the long-term durability tests and cycle tests of 4680s right now. That's that's what all the testing's for. Um, they said they were going to ask their partners to double the supply in 2022 if they're targeting 1 million this year, then 2 million in 2022. Plus all 4680 battery. I don't. I don't think they're targeting two million in 2022. Um, they could be internally, but uh, the the general trend that they even mentioned in the shareholder deck is that they want to increase their production rate by around 50 percent. Uh oh, Starlink got lagged for a second. Sorry. 
Come on, Starlink, you can find it. You can find it. All right, there. That's good. I don't. I don't think. I I don't recall anybody saying two million in twenty twenty two. Tesla's general trend has been increased production rate by fifty percent per year. Um, so that would mean seven hundred fifty thousand this year, and then maybe million and a half in twenty twenty two. Two million would be amazing, but I don't. I don't know if they can reach that that quickly. It's going to come down to forty six eighty mass production. I still think there's a chance they could hit a million this year just based on how efficient Shanghai is getting and the ramping of production in Fremont. Um, so I'm not saying it's you know impossible. I, I, I'm not saying it's likely they'll hit a million this year. I'm just saying it's possible. Um, you're right about the Cybertruck. Don't know why they're delaying it despite the gigantic order backlog. I, I'm guessing it has more to do with the Model Y being tested and proven in the sake in, by the sake of they know how to mass produce the Model Y. Um, it's a vehicle they know there's plenty of demand for, and they know how to service it, and they know how to build it profitably. They know how to scale production of the Model Y. They've done it in Fremont, and they've done it in Shanghai and seen tremendously successful results. Um, yeah, the, the plan, Andy, has never been to double the production rate per year. That would be cool, but that would be increasing production rate by 100%. Per year, they're, they're aiming for 50. At least that's what the shareholder deck is saying. They want to do 50% increase per year, not 100%. That would be doubling. Um, I hope they get to 100, but I don't. I don't know how realistic that is. Got to set expectations somewhat realistic. Um, so the, I, I would assume a million will be close this year, as in we'll probably end up being around 850 to 900 thousand this year. Chance of hitting a million, depending on how Berlin and Texas go. And then definitely well over a million in 2022, for sure. Um, does have a, a bunch of miscellaneous cars around Fremont sitting about suspiciously. <laughs> yeah. Um, Elon said they think Model Y will be the best-selling car in 2022, so they will likely aim for around 1 million Model Y production out of Berlin in Texas. Yeah, I mean, they'll both probably be pumping out Model Ys in January of, of 2022 and then only get higher and higher production rates by the end. So I don't think it's, it's a crazy assumption to assume model Y becoming one of the best selling vehicles of all time in 2022 sandbagging. <laughs> I want Tesla to be sandbagging so bad, but it, they hit, they've not been sandbagging most recently. <laughs> um, 1 million this year would be doubling. Yes. But, um, that's not the internal goal. The, the the internal goal hasn't been doubling each year. It was just that um, last year, last year because of COVID and the factory shutdowns, they didn't quite hit what they thought they were going to hit. Um, almost did, real close. Basically, did five hundred thousand was essentially reached. Um, but I don't I don't think it's realistic to assume they're going to double each year because that would imply you're hitting four million by twenty twenty three. 8 million by 2024, 16 million by 2025, and then 32 million by 20. Yeah, it's, it's not super sustainable to assume that they're going for a doubling each year. Um, what do you think about the PR issues in China? I, I don't think it makes a huge impact because from, from one, I heard that the person that was protest or not protesting, there was someone that was claiming that they had Tesla brake issues and then Tesla debunked those brake issues and then there were people found out that that person who was complaining about the brake issues had some ties to Neo or something. But ultimately, how the media reflects Tesla, I don't think is fundamentally a huge problem because ultimately Tesla has more demand than they know what to do with. So even if there is bad PR and if there's bad press going around about them, let the content creators like me, let the influencers go after them, complain about them. Tesla doesn't need to spend money or time worrying about them. They need to worry about producing these vehicles and getting their products out in the market. I think that's where their focus should go because if you're trying to dissuade the media or, or push the media in a certain way, it's probably because you're worried about demand. And based on all of these price increases, whether it be solar panels or power walls or Model 3 or Model Y prices going up, on that's another tidbit from today. They said earnings call that... Uh, Model S and X are actually cheaper to produce than the old Model S and X. I don't exactly know how that's possible, especially with the Plaid powertrain. That sounds like a tremendous amount of retooling and 
redesign and i don't you know they got the new display in the back and they've got updated interiors and stuff so i don't i don't know exactly how they're producing those cheaper but they're both like significantly more expensive than they used to be so the margins on the model s and x are going to be very very healthy um the reason a company increases prices like that is either because supply chains are impacted which could be partially the reason or because they have more demand than they know what to do with and it's like, okay, if we're getting more orders that we can't fill, we might as well just drive up the price and lower demand so that we can have thicker profit margins on the vehicles that people are willing to order. So ult ultimately, that's a good thing. Um, you can get people... Tesla has a very solid fan base, and they have a very large growing fan base of people as they're delivering so many vehicles now. There's going to be huge waves of people that are Tesla fans that didn't know much about them before. So I don't think Tesla needs to worry much about bad media or bad PR because ultimately I think the truth does come out, and I think that influencers and content creators will will do their best to defend Tesla. That's that's what we do. And um, the results speak for themselves. You know, poor marketing or poor journalism is never going to last in the age of the Internet where people can fact check and figure out who's lying and who's... And if there's people out there that believe that crap, then okay, um, they're they're not well researched and they don't know what they're talking about. But those people, I don't think we're ever going to convince. Even if Tesla did have a rock solid PR department that was going after these types of complaints, that those people would probably be like, "Yeah, that's Tesla. What do they care?" So I don't think it's that crazy for them to not have a PR division or not spend anything on marketing. I don't think I don't think it's crazy for them to just be like, "It doesn't matter." we don't care <laughs> some more communication would be fine i agree if if there's reasons for delays or if there's reasons of redesign or things that customers want to know more about for sure be more communication driven but all that stuff can be done just with your customer service department or with social media you know if there's something you want to clear up about model s production or delays you can tweet it you could tweet it out you could or do it like they did today and just save it for an earnings call um that's fine but not having a pr division is fine um i don't think Te <laughs> i don't know how you could say tesla sandbagging when they're so late on so many things <laughs> i want tesla to sandbag i do i would love if this stuff was ahead of schedule but elon was telling us model s deliveries would be in February and the website said March and here we're at the end of April. It still hasn't happened. He said the FSD beta button would be out in February or March and that still hasn't rolled out. Um, and now he's saying May is aspirational for the beta button. And, you know, we got the, at autonomy day, we were hearing that robo taxis would be ready by the end of 2020. So I'm all, I'm still a huge Tesla fan and I believe they're doing their best and they're, they don't know what they don't know. I just think that these timelines, you got to be very, very reasonable with them. Um, and you have to understand that. I don't think, I don't think that model Y being ahead of schedule or model three in China being ahead of schedule is necessarily the rule. I think that was more of an exception to the timelines and the Elon time is still very, very real. I'm um, considering they've already delayed the plaid plus, um, and it was already further away than we thought it was going to be. Um, we thought Plaid Model S and X production initially was going to be end of 2020. That's what Elon said in a tweet once. And here we are, it's still not out. And Plaid Plus, they said, was going to be end of 2021. Now they're saying it's 2022. So they do sandbag some things, but I do still think there's a lot of stuff that they, they ends up being much more complicated than they thought and ends up taking longer than they anticipate. But they will still achieve those things. Um, the products they unveil and the, the things they say they're going to do, they will do. It's just the timeline that they're not never very good at. Um, Germany's not going to go to 500,000 right away. Um, it's going to take a long time for Germany to ramp up, ramp up production. Uh, it's no secret that X and X, uh, sorry, S and X were amazing cards, but were also built using less than ideal engineering in some places. No doubt they redid the structural engineering leading to cheaper manufacturing. I'm, I'm sure there's some of that, but you know, how much really are we talking <laughs> when we're talking about adopting new displays and putting screens in the back and now they have ventilated seats and now they have active noise cancellation and, you know, they add in all this stuff that wasn't there before. I'm very curious how they meant by that. SNX refresh will be delivered 
quarter four or 2022. I hope not. They're saying this month. He said volume production Q3. Originally, they were saying Model X refresh would be April. Now they're saying Q3 for the Model X. So, you know, I have a hard time saying Tesla's sandbagging when they keep missing a lot of stuff. Model S refresh shares more parts with Model 3. Does it? I mean, they've got different displays. They've got different steering wheels. They've got different seats. They've got different center consoles. They've got different chargers. They've got different trunks, trunks, hatchbacks, speaker systems, glass. I don't know. I mean, it's speculation to say, like, oh, it shares more parts. But, I mean, we still know they use the 18650 cells. So are we talking, like, well, the door... The door button is the same. Aha! So much cheaper. To- <laughs> uh, I don't know. Well, they're getting more range than before, so I don't know what you mean by same range. Uh, we need the Tesla tequila to be prioritized. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So because they didn't drop too much information, I'm not planning on doing a recap video. Um, the biggest takeaways from this event is that the Model S and X ramp was more difficult than they thought. Um, I'm sure it'll be more profitable. It's, I mean, it costs like ten to thirty thousand dollars more than it used to. Before the refreshed, the Model S long range started at wasn't it like six? Yeah, it was that. That was the one that was sixty nine thousand four twenty. Now it's eighty thousand, so it's ten thousand more on the S long range, and the performance Model S I believe was like ninety thousand. I know it was sub a hundred. I remember that. And now the the plaid the performance Model S went away and was replaced by the plaid Model S, which is a hundred and twenty thousand. So that's like a thirty to forty thousand dollar jump. So yeah, I'm I'm sure the profitability of it will go up quite a bit if you raise prices. Yeah, there's thicker gaps there. But um, I also think they're giving themselves plenty of room on the S and X to lower the price in the future, kind of to troll Lucid when Lucid hits the market or the you know EQS or more premium models come out. If Tesla feels uh, weakening demand in any of those fields, they'll probably just be like, okay, let's drop five grand off the S and X. Let's call it, let's call it a day. Um, 99,000. Okay. Well, it's still a $20,000 jump. Um, the price for the performance S fluctuated quite a bit and ludicrous mode added a bunch. So on a chassis level, I'm about sure they changed a lot and reduced parts, streamlined manufacturing. The S and X were old designs with quite a few inefficiencies. They were, but Either way, I'm just questioning how you can add a whole motor <laughs> and make it for cheaper. I don't know. Um, 20K jump is big. Um, that's that's obviously going to add a lot to That's When you're talking about a $100,000 car, that's a 20% increase in price. That's pretty massive. Do you think all of the legacy op manufacturers will survive the transition to EVs? No. I mean, not all. Uh, some will. Some won't. I, I think it'd be pretty unrealistic to assume all of them will. I mean, some are probably going to be too stubborn in their ways or too hesitant to transition, and then they're going to be left in the dust. Um, no, not all S and X and tri motors. That's why I'm saying how, uh, how do they figure it costs less to make? Are they just talking about the base models or are they also saying the tri motor variants are also cheaper to make than the performance models that they were replacing? I don't know what they meant by that. I would have preferred a little elaboration there. Um, yeah, there are definitely a few brands that I don't think will survive and won't make the transition. Um, I think we would have known in the S if the S and X got mega castings, I think they would have made that pretty obvious or we would have heard about it. Model Y mega castings were pretty obvious and pretty noticeable. Um, yeah, I, I'm not saying 20 K is overpriced. It's, it's completely justified. I agree. I'm just saying, of course, if you raise the price that will make a more profitable machine. Um, just with less scale, but because this is a refresh, um, obviously I think that's going to drive a lot of people to upgrade now that haven't upgraded in years because they're like, Oh, finally now there's a, I mean, I think it's safe to say this S and X refresh is the biggest one we've ever seen. Um, can they stop bullying my boy, Peter? (laughs) I want to see Lucid succeed. I think Lucid will. Um, I think that there's a big enough market for Lucid to coexist with Tesla, but Tesla is going to do what Tesla does, which is be competitive. So for everybody who despises Tesla for either their quality control or their design choices or their autonomy preferences with their interiors or their lack of premium build, um, Lucid's going to pick that up. 
uh, and try to combat with that argument. But Tesla is going to combat with the range, the performance and the price. Um, Tesla is still going to be like, yeah, we're cheaper. Oh, we have better range. Oh, we can do this. We're better performing. You know, Tesla loves their specs. They're going to stick to those. They're going to stick to those specs and try to keep beating everybody on them. But um, Lucid's, I don't think going purely based off of specs, the Lucid's going more for that, that luxury feel and that preference of, of premium interior. Um, comparing tri-motor to old dual motors, comparing apples to bananas. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Uh, to me, it's still a lot of speculation. I mean, I, I think a lot of people are just assuming they know things that they don't know. Um, in which case most of these people that are assuming this would have assumed Model S deliveries would have been on time. Aren't the Taycan and EQS competing more with Lucid than Tesla? Possibly, yeah. I would argue since Lucid has a big focus on interior build quality, and that's what they're going for. But um, like a lot of people said in my video about Lucid, the Taycan isn't really competitive with the Lucid on range. And I guess the EQS kind of is, but it might be a lower volume. What do you think about the FSD button in Europa? Well, I mean, we're not, we can't even get it here. So I'm guessing Europe is probably years away from getting that type of... Uh, software <laughs> um they didn't want to talk about the fsd subscription price or the beta button during this call which i was really hoping they would because if they do plan on launching the subscription in this quarter i felt like now would have been a decent time but maybe they want to just do it via site refresh maybe the price for the subscription isn't that good so they're not too super proud of it and maybe they don't want to draw too much attention to it so expect it to be expensive though um, I've seen a lot of people with too much wishful thinking. I mean, I'd love to be wrong and the FSD subscription ends up being way cheaper than we think, but I don't think that's where your expectations should be set. Um, yeah, Europa. Yeah. Jupiter's moon, right? <laughs> when are we getting the button there? Um, but yeah, I, I think it's safe to assume it will probably be between 200 and probably way above $200 a month, possibly more than $300 a month. Um, that's what you should set your expectations with. I, I think it would be possibly very sad and disappointing if you get your hopes up for an FSD subscription to be under 100 because just the idea of having... This isn't something Tesla does very often, right? Like Tesla fairly rarely has a way for you to buy something outright and also subscribe to it. The only comparable comparable thing I can imagine is leasing a Tesla versus buying one outright. And in that way, Tesla, I believe, is still going to want to prioritize saying buying it outright is financially the better call. It financially will make more sense for you to buy it outright. Um, they've said that multiple times, which means that the subscription cannot sound like a better deal than buying it outright for most people. So I'm assuming that would result in the subscription being pretty high. Um, FSD is full self-driving for aces. <laughs> Mega casting on SNX. Haven't heard about it. They haven't talked about it, and I have not seen any rumors or leaks suggesting that's happening. So I don't understand why we should assume it is if there's not really any evidence. Purely speculative. I'd say split the price of FSD in about eight years, and that's about what it should be. So the price of FSD changes a lot. Right now it's 10K. Um, there's eight let's see 12 times 8 is 96 so if we divide 10,000 by 96 that would be about $104 a month if that's if they go with five uh with 8 years i think they're going to go with less because that's 8 years is the amount of ownership for um average amount of car ownership and i think a lot of people are going to go with less than that if, if anybody's planning on owning a Tesla for less than eight years, and I believe a lot of people are, people who trade in their cars or people on leases or people that are planning on upgrading their car to a better one later, uh, yeah, I, I think that they're probably going to do it more based on like five. $200 is just right. 200 times 12 months is 2,400 times five years. 12,000, which is more than 10,000, which makes sense. Yeah, if, if they know that the average length of car ownership is around eight years, then it would make more sense for me to, to sit at around 200. Prediction for next Tesla product. Tesla Pogo Stick. How are we going to mass produce the Pogo Stick? It's just made of 4680s. 
pogo stick has a structural battery pack. <laughs> uh, this Tesla Verge Transportation said Tesla turns another profit despite new Model S and Model X delay. Um, I I would say it's more impressive that despite shutting down the Model S and X production lines, they're still able to turn a profit. That's kind of cool. Then. Um, Let's see. I need a two-door Tesla to replace my two-door Subaru. Roadster is pretty much the only two-door you're probably going to get. <laughs> I'm so unhappy with Tesla's solar install process. Been a nightmare. I have heard that a lot. Uh, I looked into it a little bit, and I had seen a lot of people complaining about communication with Tesla on solar installations and how crappy of an experience it's been for a lot of people. Um that's what Andy's saying as well. Mine was too last year. Planned in February, installed in late June. It sucked. Happy now, though. Well, I'm glad it's happy now, but I hope they can improve their communication and that kind of stuff. Um, the truck is obviously what we all want. I think that that's fair to say, but we got literally no updates on the Cybertruck today, which is a shame because we got to wait another three months till the next earnings call. Imagine the quick charge on a small Tesla. Well, the charging speed has fairly little to do with the size of the battery, more so the rate at which the battery can receive a charge. You know, the standard range Teslas don't charge substantially faster than the long range Teslas. Um, in fact, I think they slow they charge at a slower speed because they can get more miles quicker with a lower amount of energy. But um they they still at battery day said to expect a, a 25k model in three-ish years. So I don't think it's reasonable to assume we'll get it in the US in 2022. There were some paperwork and regulatory filings in Shanghai talking about having a 25k model next year. So if we're talking China, yeah, I could agree seeing a uh, Model 2 unveiling there and deliveries next year, I could see. But in the US, probably not. Um, in the US, I would say probably still safe to assume 2023, 2024. Um, Berlin is probably going to prioritize Model 2 right after Model Y. They used to list Model 3 next to Model Y in the Berlin section saying in development, and they removed it. Um, so that makes me think that Berlin is going to prioritize Model Y first, and then after that they're going to start working on, obviously, 4680s and then Model 2, or whatever they end up calling it. Uh, my installation was very quick, but they've been lagging on submitting paperwork to my electric company. I have to keep calling. Uh, they were way more responsive before install. That's weird. Like after they put the product on, that's when they're like, eh. I'd say take their time on 4680Ys. That's my mother's next vehicle. I'm Based off of today's earnings call, it seems like they'll be taking their time on lots of stuff. <laughs> I'm starting to feel like we might not see Cybertruck for over a year from now. That's honestly how I'm starting to feel. It's it's hearing them talk about 4680s and volume production being 12 to 18 months away, and we're in April, end of April right now. It makes me think like it might be second half. When do you think they will launch the configurator for the SCV? Do you mean the cyber van? What do you mean CV? Compact vehicle? I mean the configurators typically launch after the unveilings, but if you're talking cyber truck, then um. I don't understand why people keep speculating about when the configurator will go live. It's the Cybertruck. What configuration do you need? There's no colors. <laughs> There's probably only going to be one tire option, too. I'd be kind of surprised if they decide to have more tire options. <laughs> I don't like I don't I don't get I don't get it where the the configurators are going to change much. Early 2020 true Cybertruck predictions looking poorly aged now. Oh, yeah. I'm course correcting as we speak, but to be fair, Mike's current prediction was January. I'm, I'm curious if he wants to update that. <laughs> Mike was saying, let me find it here. It's in my calendar. Mm, Mike's predicted Cybertruck delivery was January 15th of 2022. I'm, do, do you want to update that, Mike? Tesla has taken their time on the Roadster for quite some time now. Oh, yeah, and the Semi. They've they've taken their time. They've got almost more vehicles um, in the prototype phase than they have vehicles uh, that are actually being mass-produced. We've got S, X, 3, and Y, and then we've got Roadster, Cybertruck, Semi, 
I guess that's it. And then ATV, maybe you want to count that <laughs> cyber quad or the model two, which they've confirmed the existence of, they've said, you know, they, they haven't given an unveiling date or anything, but they, they did say at battery day, they would have a 25 K model in about three years. But I, I think that three years was probably too generous. Probably going to be more like four from battery day. Um, my prediction was March, April, 2022. I'm not very confident now. <laughs> Okay, Mike is still holding confident January for early Cybertruck deliveries. I I believed back in early 2020 that Cybertruck deliveries could be on on schedule or early, but that was before we knew what Giga Texas was prioritizing. Um, once we found out that Giga Texas was going to do Model Y first, I don't know if I said that in the videos, but that's what I recall saying in my mind when I was like, if Giga Texas just focuses on Cybertruck first then deliveries will be in 2021. But if it does Model Y first, then I doubt it. And that obviously ended up being the case. Um, I, I'm, I'd be kind of surprised if they can still get early deliveries in January. When Mike made his prediction, mine was uh, March, like er, mid-March by the looks of it. Um, but now thinking about the 4680 ramp and how much time it's taking i'm like eh maybe we should sandbag our timelines ourselves because tesla ain't a lot of the time <laughs> also the van yeah they've confirmed that the van will happen but less officially it was just like a afterthought during a comment and a earnings call van is probably end of the list um cybertruck options quad camping storage bins seat dashboard color two tire versions no, I doubt it. Those are all accessories. That's not a configurator. Those are all things that would show up in the accessories package. Seat dashboard color? Maybe. They do that with the 3 and Y. But honestly, knowing it's Tesla with the Cybertruck, I wouldn't be shocked if they decide to not have any color options. Just have one. You know, when they unveiled the Model Y, the configurator went up and they showed all the different color options and uh, trims and stuff but when they unveiled the Cybertruck they didn't launch any of that they revamped the Model Y configurator later but for the most part after the unveiling you could customize the color and stuff same with the Model 3 um, I mean you don't decide whether or not you want a roof rack at your Model Y during the configuration process but that's an accessory that's where I would see storage bins and the camping package and I don't know I, I just have a hard time visualizing any other tire on the cyber truck that's why i don't think there will be i don't think there will be much of a configurator i think that the current cyber truck configurator is pretty spot on to what the actual one will be might be slightly different but the color would be a cheap option overall probably but it, it all results in more uh manufacturing complexity and they've pretty much only shown that one Cybertruck prototype, whereas the Model 3, they had all these different options when it first launched and they first unveiled it. But um, I'm, I'm still convinced they're going to keep the mass production of the Cybertruck as minimal as possible. And I also think there's a good chance of them scrapping the single motor version just due to the price being so low and also the um, popularity of it being a lot lower. It's basically going to be, do you want two motors or three motors? And do you want full self-driving? That's all your configuration. <laughs> that camping package is going to be one heck of an accessory add-on. Looking at the render, that's a lot of material to ship to service centers. Honestly, that's the type of thing I would not be shocked if um, Tesla doesn't go forward with it. <laughs> Same with the trailer. I can tell it doesn't exist based on the render. Um, and the idea of going through the checkout process and asking if you want a big camping thing to come with it i don't know that just doesn't seem like tesla to me there's all kinds of weird like packages you can get for the y and three that third parties make but tesla yeah i don't know we'll find out later off-road tires versus street tires maybe i could see that but i again I, i'm not going to count on it i'm not going to assume it's going to happen personally I think that the different trims will be how many motors do you want? <laughs> That's your only option. Um, the truck needs an interior blue light on the roof and play apocalyptic sounds and music for the mood. Yeah, that sounds genius. 
let's make that happen. Did you see in the investor deck that Gigafactory Texas is only referred to as the Model Y factory? I did. I brought that up on Twitter, by the way, because uh, Dirty Tesla was saying, like, which vehicles are coming out of Texas? And I was like, well, the labeling of the po photos all say Model Y factory. Um, oh, Elon's going off on Twitter now. What did he what did he respond to? Elon Musk sharing that he thinks Model Y will become the top selling vehicle of any kind in 2022 or 2023. Um, seems quite likely, at least based on revenue in 2022 and possibly total units in 2023. OK, so Elon clarified his statement saying that it might not sell. You know, this is not a for sure thing. This is just a prediction of his. Um, but he's saying that based on revenue, the Model Y could be the top selling vehicle in 2022 and then total units possibly 2023 and people are all asking about Cybertruck every reply I'm looking at on his tweets are just about the Cybertruck and then he also replied to someone else saying Elon bought Bitcoin and dumped it and then he said no I I have not sold any of my Bitcoin Tesla sold 10% of its holdings to essentially prove liquidity of Bitcoin as an alternative to holding cash on balance sheet I think that's a good move because after Tesla bought Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin went up quite a bit. So wanting to sell part of it to, to prove the liquidity, um, they profited probably quite a bit off of selling that Bitcoin, which is good. Um, so he, he's going off on Twitter a bit, but yeah, they did, they did sell a little crypto, not all of it, but they're still accepting. They're still accepting crypto as a purchase method. Uh, not in a hurry to see Plaid Plus S Roadster in normal people's hands, to be honest. After seeing Rimax C2 Mall, that Taycan Turbo S, like it was a Camry. I don't know that people can handle that kind of speed. Those those kind of cars are cool, but th yeah, to me, they're not very much game changers. It's really just rich people toys at that point. What's game changing is more affordable vehicles that are practical and have good range and affordability. You know, that's that's to me what's more of a game changer something that's not really on the market already and i feel like we already have lots of high price decent range high performance electric vehicles on the road and the plaid plus is just kind of adding to that noise at a certain point we have to stop caring about range in my opinion you know like gas cars don't brag about range the best selling cars are not the cars with the best range it's usually about the best mileage in other words the best efficiency you know, there, there are certain gas cars you can buy today that go well over 700 miles, but that's not a huge selling point anymore. And in my opinion, once the range starts exceeding 400, it starts to not really make that big of an impact. So it becomes more about not how much range can you get and more like how much range can you get for this low a price? Um, that's what's far more interesting to me. Um, and that's what's far more interesting to me about the Cybertruck is getting great range and great practicality, and the design is cool, and none of the other Teslas or EVs on the market really compete with the Cybertruck and utility and that kind of thing. So to me, that makes a massive difference, whereas making a $150,000 car that can go 500 miles is not, it's not very game-changing in my opinion. It's not, it's like, okay, great. It's another flex. Rich people can brag about that. Um, but we've kind of known that you can make compelling electric cars that are expensive. That, that, point has been made for like nearly a decade now we've known that you know even the first model s one car of the year and people loved it and people had lots of nice things to say about it so we know you can make a good ev that's expensive <laughs> that can be done um but we want to see evs become more than just you know rich people cars um let's see probably in Q3. Can't, can't wait to see if Tesla are going to make Model X Plaid Plus. My guess is once they can ramp 4680s enough, there won't be a need for Plaid Plus. I think that the reason there's a Plaid and a Plaid Plus right now is because they want some of the Plaid powertrains to come out right now, and they also want to show that the 4680s can do so much more. But um, once 4680s are ramped, I really don't see the point. Why would you have a Plaid and a Plaid Plus? Just go all in on the Plaid Plus variant and turn it into plaid and that one just has the great range and the difference between a hundred and twenty thousand car and a hundred and fifty thousand dollar car i don't think makes a huge impact to if you're spending six figures on a vehicle it's not that big a deal um let's see 
My wife has no idea I'm getting her the Cybertruck, but really it's mine in a way. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> I don't think that'll end well. <laughs> I don't think Cybertruck will sell very well in Europe as everyone here is driving a Mini or something. Well, it's not intended to. The, the Cybertruck's primary demographic is the Ford F-150. That's the best-selling pickup in the United States. And the pickup truck market in Europe is substantially lower than the United States. I think it's like less than 10% number of trucks. So if you're going to design a truck, it makes sense to optimize it for the United States market. That's where most of the sales are. So yeah, Elon has said, and the website still says to this day that the Cybertruck specs are based on the US version. If they do the Cybertruck overseas, it will probably look and have completely different specs than the one we're looking at. Um, my car, my car goes about 680 miles, but very rarely I use over 200, 300 in a day, only on road trips, which don't occur anyway. Um, at 400, 450 range battle pretty much stops being a thing. I would argue with EVs, it's even less because you can charge from home. If you can't charge from home, okay, then fine. Yeah, having a range that's close to a gas car is pretty important. But majority of people do have access of some kind to charge from home. And then you're leaving the house at 80 to 90% every day, whereas a gas car can't do that. You know, just, just the other day, um, was it just yesterday? I think we were leaving the house and we left, we, we left the house and the car had, you know, an eighth or a ninth of a tank left. So it was almost out of gas and we hadn't driven anywhere in like three or four days. And I was like, well, if this was an EV, sure. The total range, the max range would not be as high as this gas car, but the gas car range is from the pump, not from my house. Whereas the EV range is going to be a lot more consistent. You don't have to think. Sorry, it's getting darker outside. You don't have to think as much about like, ooh, how much gas is still in there? And then you got to make the errand of like, okay, before we go on this trip, I'm going to stop at the gas station to fill up. Instead, it's just, nope, we're good. So that's why to me, a 300-mile range EV could potentially be more practical than a 400-mile range. Like I, my, my gas car can go probably 470 miles on a tank, but I would much rather have like a 250 mile EV because I know it would be the same range every time I left the house, which is more important to me because I don't have to run an errand. I can just charge instead of like, oh yeah, I got to go to the gas station. Right. That's another trip. I got to get all stinky and then the gas is expensive. <laughs> um, let's see. GT and turns racing series cars will charge at 700 kilowatts. How long do you think we'll have to wait before that kind of charging speed makes it to the average Joe? Because that'll sell. I don't think it's that necessary. I think it's kind of overkill, to be honest. I think that um, 250 kilowatt charging is insanely fast as is. That's about a thousand miles an hour. And after 250 kilowatts, it becomes very little about the charging speed itself and more about the sustained rates. So there's actually certain EVs that have been on the record for charging faster than EVs with a higher charge rate because they can sustain those rates longer. In other words, Teslas can hit 250 kilowatts at a V3 supercharger if there's not too many cars charging there. But if they only can do 250 kilowatts for five minutes and then they go way down slower because the battery can't handle the charge, it doesn't really matter. Whereas another car that maxes out at 150 kilowatts, if it can if it can sustain that charge speed throughout the entire duration of the charge, it will actually get more miles quicker. So the top charge speed of the kilowatt rating is not really that big a deal. If, if you could sustain 250 kilowatts for the entire charge, yeah, you could you could go to 100% in like 15 minutes, but that's not good for the battery. So it becomes more of a battery chemistry problem. Getting to 700 kilowatts doesn't really make sense. It, it's really more about getting the battery to a point where you can sustain those types of rates. That's what matters more. Sustaining 250 kilowatts for a longer period of time is what I think matters more. You think the truck will have a massive speaker that will make massive fart sounds? Absolutely. Why not? Come on. This is Tesla. We expect nothing less. <laughs> um, let's see. I mean, a, a Tesla Semi will charge at megawatts, but that's because the battery is so huge. Um, when you have a battery that large, you can pump a lot of energy into it without really harming it very much. I think that chargers will be at 450 kilowatt charging speed in 10 years. After that, it won't go up anymore. Most chargers will be 350. I don't think it's, it's really about the peak 
current rate. It has more to do with the sustained rate. If you could sustain 250 kilowatts without slowing down, that's 1,000 miles an hour. Think about that. 1,000 miles an hour means if your range is 400 miles, you'd be done charging in 20 minutes. Or you'd get to 80% in like 15 minutes, which is pretty close to what we have now. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's it's... I mean, I don't think we need to go up much faster than that. It's more about sustainability. Did you hear about the wireless charging mats and parking spaces in Iceland? Well, that's been a thing for a few years. It's not that new. It's just not a very efficient form of charging. But it's a very convenient form. I'll give it that. I, I just think the robotic arm is more convenient, more versatile. The big charging mats are pretty expensive, and you have to build specific parking spaces, whereas the little snake charger robotic arm you could install almost anywhere. Um, wouldn't be as complicated to put it under the ground. Um, tricking batteries to allow a higher sustained charge rate is the golden goose of EV charging. Exactly. I think people are getting a little too obsessed with the 250 kilowatt, 300 kilowatt. That that thing doesn't matter if you can't keep it sustained. Weren't there some talks about multiple batteries charging at the same time, similar to what phones are doing? Well, that's all EVs. EVs aren't using single cell batteries. They they have tons of batteries inside them. You charge each of them up simultaneously. That's that's how it works currently. Um, <laughs> I like Ben's message. He said, "I have the truck on order, but because I'm rich, I ordered the Model X Plaid to hold me over. Great functionality and space, and fast as food. Can't wait. Love your videos. <laughs> Thanks, Ben." Let me know if you want to do a video with it. That sounds fun. Faster than gasoline, then we win. Eh. I don't think it has to beat the speed of gasoline, to be honest, because gasoline is almost uncomfortably quick. It's so quick that you can't really get back in the car and start waiting. You have to kind of sit next to the car as it's filling up and watch it. Whereas um, EVs, you can charge from home. So even if they're not as fast as filling up at a gas station, they're more convenient to charge because you don't have to go anywhere. Yeah, I think a lot of people, most of the people I've talked to with EVs don't want to go back to having a gas car. Um, and a lot of studies and statistics have shown that. Like uh, Dirty Tesla, I was just talking to him, uh, Chris, recently uh, for the EV podcast, but it ran into some technical difficulties. So now I'm not sure if you guys will be able to watch that, but um it has to be more convenient than gas. Exactly. Thank you. It, it's not about being faster than gas. It's being more convenient. And he was saying that he was really into Tesla because of the technology and the software and the autonomous driving stuff. And he thought that was really impressive. And he thought the EV part of it would be a bit of an inconvenience. He was like, oh, okay, I got to charge from home and the range is lower. But once he actually got the car, he was like, oh, no, this is terrible. <laughs> he was like, gas is terrible, not EVs are terrible. He was saying, like, I don't want to go back to a gas car. This is far more convenient than having a gas car, despite the range being lower. It's like different kinds of range. Um, charging via induction is is far more difficult, far more expensive um, than... <sighs> I think you know what I mean. I love relaxing and playing cat RPGs while I charge during a trip. Let's me relax for a bit. Yeah, I've seen that too. Usually the charge time gives people the ability to, you know, take a bathroom break or get some food, get some snacks. So it's, I don't like that mentality. I've seen several YouTubers bring that up before where they're just like EVs can start replacing gas cars when they have the same range and you can charge them as fast as a gas station can fill up a car. I'm like, mm, I think you're looking at it the wrong way. I think you're saying like cars will replace horses when I can put hay in them and they will drive, you know, <laughs> like I, it's, it's like a backwards mindset. Um, you don't have to be charging to rest. No, but the charging gives you a good excuse to rest. Uh, to, in today's world, you can't get inside the bathroom or buy a snack and be back before the pump is done. So double or triple the rate of gas filling doesn't matter if you go in and get oh, get a water or pee. That's true. Um, you think Elon Musk is watching this live stream? I think 100% no. There's literally zero chance. The electric danger noodle is probably a project I would love to help Tesla with, whether it be engineering, cost yield analysis. I think that would make a big difference. If you could, especially if it was raining, if it was raining and then you drove to a supercharger and just backed into one and then it plugged in and you didn't have to get out of the car, 
that's like infinitely more convenient than a gas station to me. The charge time suck in COVID because you can't stop and go inside anywhere, but it's better than gas. I mean, nowadays, as long as you got a mask, I think you can go in and get what you need to from what I've seen. I, I know several people that have Teslas that have been road tripping since the pandemic. Um, but as someone who has driven my car with a range of 470 miles nonstop until it was out of gas, that was not enjoyable. <laughs> I don't care what your priority of time or, or, or trying to make good travel time on the road trip is like driving that car 400 over 400 miles before stopping. It's just not fun. You just feel miserable to be honest. Um, especially when it doesn't drive itself. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't help the situation either. But yeah, I last year drove my car, um, on a real big road, a uh, fairly big road trip. And when you, when you've been driving for like six, seven, eight hours, you just want to stop and you don't want to get back in again for a, a little while. So I would very, 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 very much be okay having a shorter range vehicle that forces me to stop for 20 or 30 minutes at each charge. Um, the only bad thing about charging is the weight when road tripping. Yeah, it's arguably bad in my opinion. Like I guess some people have a very urgent way of road tripping where they're just like, we got to go. We got to get make, to we got to go. We got to get going. So every time you stop at a gas station, you have like five minutes, everybody go to the bathroom, get a thing. We're almost, we got to get going. And it's just this urgency and this rush in my opinion. That's like, yeah, you'll get where you want to go faster, but you'll be more miserable in the process. <laughs> I don't really like driving. I don't know if you guys know that about me, but that's one of the reasons I'm a big fan of Tesla's is because they seem to be putting a huge emphasis on getting rid of driving. And I'm kind of like, yeah, that sounds fun. Um, I would love to just get in the car and have it drive. And then I just sit in the chair and it drives me around and I can watch TV or use my phone or sleep. That's, that's kind of the end goal for me. I'm not one of those people that's just like, don't you love just driving around and having fun? There are certain days where, you know, nice windy road and the weather's good and you're just going to go out in some nature space. Yeah, okay, I can get that. But that's not the majority of driving. That's majority of driving is traffic and, you know, long stretches of highway. And, you know, that's what a lot of it is. Um, some people road trip with two or more drivers. They do because it's so frustrating to drive. But um, other people can't or don't. A lot of people are driving by themselves, so um, don't you think that people who have to constantly commute long distances will ever be happy with EVs? There are. I don't know why there's this general consensus in the chat that we haven't won that demographic yet. I, I know several people that have had to commute uh, pretty great distances to work and back, and they buy Teslas, and they love it because they can turn on autopilot or navigate on autopilot. They've got the safest vehicle in the world that they're inside and they can charge from home so they don't have to stop at gas stations and they save a lot of money because it's far cheaper to charge a car than to fill it up with gas and they're quiet and they're fun cars to drive. So yeah, like the, the people who have to commute with long distances, I do think enjoy currently. I know they're in this very live stream. <laughs> Mike has to commute quite a bit. No, I'm not doing a recap video. There wasn't any really major news announcements, so live stream's good. Uh, my way won't even matter to you in any negative way. Your way bugs my kind of road trips. My solution's mo better. <laughs> well, there's not always there's not always road trips I go on with more than one driver. Sometimes it's just me, or sometimes it's just my wife, and my wife doesn't want to drive, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be doing the driving. Uh, I commute almost two hours a day and I love my EV. Autopilot is a game changer and a stress fatigue saver. Exactly. Mike is the classic example of someone who has a pretty great commute. And Randy, um, he's moving right now. Um, but before he quit his last job, he was he had to drive to that every day. And he loved it. They had nothing but nice things to say about it. Um, so, yeah, it's... There's not a lot of demographics, in my opinion. The only demographics EVs aren't hitting yet are the ultra budget. Like, Model 3 is actually pretty close to um, the price of an average car. Uh, the average selling price of a vehicle, I think I looked it up the other day. I think it was around 37 average price of new car. The other problem is that Teslas don't devalue very much. So if you want to get a used one, they're, they're typically not that much cheaper 
Average cost of a new car was $37,851 in 2021. So compared to buying a new car, Model 3 is pretty dang close to what the average price is. So in the in the average new car price territory, Teslas are pretty close. But um, plus factor in the tax credits and the gas savings, it's probably a bit lower than that than if you were to buy a brand new car that was $37,000 and you got to get oil changes and pay for gas and all that. Um, ID4 with federal tax credit and incentives is like 32000 and that's an SUV. Um, which is another reason I'm a big fan of the ID4. I think that's a very great value vehicle. It's not the best vehicle in the world, but in terms of value, it's pretty impressive. Um, so the more interesting de- development is how we can get EVs into the sub thirty thousand, and then hopefully sub twenty thousand dollar markets, and then the used ones start going, you know, sub fifteen, sub ten one day. EVs overall have less parts, so. I do think ultimately that it will get to a point where EVs new could actually be cheaper than new gas cars. It it won't be tomorrow. It won't be in the next five years, but I do think we'll eventually get there. Maybe, maybe by 2030 or so we could get to the point where new, if the, if they're anticipating to have a 25 K Tesla by 2024, 2025, then I think it's reasonable to assume we could start seeing 20 K Teslas by 2030 or maybe sub 20 K um, just with the economies of scale and manufacturing getting cheaper and that kind of thing. And that's that's why I think it makes a lot of sense for governments to be like, we're going to kill off all new gas car sales by 2030, 2035. But yeah, by then, EVs are going to have great range and still very affordable pricing um, to the point that a gas car is just going to start to make very little sense. I don't know if Aptera qualifies for the tax incentive, but it's, it's definitely going to be more of a niche vehicle just – from a practical standpoint, two door vehicles in general do not sell extremely well, nor do three wheels. But I imagine Aptera will eventually be the best selling vehicle in its class when it comes to three wheeled vehicles or maybe two door EVs. I don't know of that many. I guess you got the smart car. I could see the Aptera outselling the smart car. Um, why not make the 25K Tesla an electric vehicle without autonomous features? Because the autonomous features aren't the expensive part. The, the amount of money it costs to put autonomous features in in a vehicle are very little. It's like probably under $1,000 to put in the cameras and the FSD computer. It's not. Also, Tesla can make a lot of their money back on the 25K Tesla through autonomous driving revenue. People subscribing to the FSD subscription and autopilot and like Elon was on some podcast, I forget which one, but he said, we thought that making a vehicles without autonomous driving hardware would be about as practical as a horse. And I do think that there's a lot of truth that once you do crack the code on level five autonomy, and once we assume, I we don't know how far away it is, I still think it could be nine, 10 years away. But once we do find a way to make cars drive themselves, the practicality of them or their ability to become robo taxis start to shoot way up. So making sure that all of the cars you produce have the hardware to do that makes sense. 46 at 46 bet for yes. Like uh Karachi games said 46 80 batteries are what's going to decrease the price of making a Tesla taking out the autopilot cameras or the full self-driving computer is not saving them a ton of money. That's probably in regards to manufacturing parts and cost, I bet it's like $500. I bet like those little cameras they put, they're not high resolution cameras either. That's the thing. <laughs> they're like, I think they're like 1.2 megapixel cameras that can record at 36 frames a second. Like they're not, they're not like iPhone 12 pro max level, like heavy duty ultra wide cameras. Like there's eight cameras that all probably cost like 20 bucks and the FSD computer chip, um, there's a lot of R&D costs, but once you mass produce them, it's not expensive at all. Um, so yeah, the, taking out the FSD hardware is not not going to save you much money. If they if they decided to make a Model 3 without any autopilot hardware, I bet it, they would still charge about what it costs today. Do you think there will be a lot of pushback against driverless cars from people like truck drivers and taxi drivers in the future? Oh yeah, I don't think their pushback will work, but I could, I could definitely imagine people getting angry about that. Um, already there's a lot of anger in the dealerships that don't want to sell EVs. That's been a recurring problem for VW and 
based on my buddy Nick's experience with Ford, it doesn't appear that they're too happy about <laughs> the electric vehicle revolution because that's kind of taking out the dealer model, which is what a lot of people do for a living. So when they find out that, oh, we don't need dealers anymore, they're kind of like, eh, I don't like that. Autonomous is one of the main things they're known for. They won't leave that out of a car. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. There's not much financial benefit. It's one of the things that people love about Tesla. So yeah, there's no real point. Um, let's see. I would love to just have an induction charger spot on my driveway rather than cables that you have to plug in every time. I agree. Um, it's just a matter of does a robotic charger arm that can line itself in and plug into your charge plug or a giant magnetic uh, charge coil underneath your parking space, which one costs more? Right now, we're not really sure because no one's mass producing either. My, my belief is that the robotic arm would be cheaper to manufacture because there are a few companies prototyping prototyping and experimenting with the giant charge mat thing it's not very cheap though and it's not very scalable um yeah there's people in detroit vandalizing evs because they hurt gm yeah if fsd worked 100 percent, how long until it would be approved to not pay attention yeah that's a good question actually yeah um who asked that alexander that's a good question if they could prove that the full self-driving software worked flawlessly and never made any mistakes, how long would it be until the government was okay with people not looking at the road? Charger arm won't happen this decade. Well, you don't know that. I don't know that. I could argue maybe the inductive coil won't happen this... I, I would say a robotic arm that just has to align with a port and plug in sounds a lot easier to manufacture than giant charge coils that are so also... Those charge coils are a lot less efficient. They're, they don't charge as quickly. Whereas the robotic arm, you could install at superchargers, you could install at third-party chargers, you could install at home. Like, it would be very difficult to install that indu inductive charge mat into someone's garage. It's very likely they would either have to get a giant mat with a bunch of cables, or they would have to dig up the concrete, or you can just plug in this little sidearm, just for the sake of it volume-wise taking up a lot less space. My buddy who drives produce for the East Coast doesn't seem them as a threat as his commutes are a thousand plus miles. That is time sensitive. EV can't touch that yet, but he's down to buy a consumer friendly EV. Yeah, they're not really. I mean, Tesla Semi hasn't even hit the roads yet, so they've definitely got a while. But um, I think uh, it'll get there. I do think eventually, yeah, long, heavy duty trucks that have to go thousands and thousands of miles that's not the majority of semi driving but that is a portion of it um the, the evs will eventually get there it's just a matter of time i think a lot of people seem to look at the tesla semi incorrectly like to me it's like think of it as the first of its kind right there's not that many all-electric class 8 trucks out there um similarly when the tesla roadster came out that was kind of the first of its kind like a sporty practical you know, high performance EV, the range was around 200 miles. And that was the first try. And then a few years went by and they eventually found a way to make EVs with much better range than that, that are far cheaper and more practical. So we've seen that transition take place. And I think a very similar transition could happen with the Tesla Semi right now. Okay. It's going to cover, I would say a pretty wide user base, pretty much anybody who drives trucking routes around 250 miles We'll be able to get a Tesla Semi, uh, save a lot of money on gas, uh, save a lot of money on maintenance, and move their vehicles and charge them as they're loading and unloading. And th there can be a lot of financial benefits to buying a vehicle like this, the beautiful Tesla Semi. And over time, maybe five, ten years from now, the battery chemistries will improve, the economies of scale will improve to the point that also, powertrain efficiency will improve to the point that you'll be able to get a thousand mile range with a payload on the semi. It's probably not possible now or even in the next five years, but eventually I do think it'll get there. It's just it's not going to be in the first generation, just like the first the first Tesla the company made was not the Model 3. It wasn't like a 35K Model 3 and then they worked their way up. No, they started with the high price, low range, and then as time gets on, they can lower the price and increase the range. That's pretty much what's happened. Um, let's see. 
yeah, he's in the five to ten percentile of semi truck drivers that don't have to worry about EVs for a while as their commutes are way too long in distance. Where do I get that toy? Tesla.com. Or ask Model Y Mike. <laughs> Smaller batteries will have good range and cheaper to make. Yeah, lithium iron phosphate, I, th I think, has a lot of potential. I bet a lot of people will be able to live comfortably with a 250-mile range Model 2. It's Even people that have cars that can go 400 miles, I, I think that even that demographic will transition to a pretty comfortable um 250 mile ev that they can charge from home and on trips they can charge them with superchargers pretty quickly pretty efficiently and they'll be very practical and very futuristic and basically there won't be a cooler car you can buy for 25k elon would say better car but better is very subjective as is cooler i guess but i'm just saying like with a car with futuristic software and all that stuff like there there will be a very hard time being any kind of competition to a 25k tesla um can i do a video on the hummer ev i've done a couple you can look them up but i don't have many additional thoughts outside of the couple videos i've done on the hummer ev um will we ever move to completely solar power to charge all cars Probably not completely all solar, but I do believe a, a substantial portion of the population will probably move to solar. As solar costs have been dropping dramatically, and there's more and more mandates of like newer houses having to adopt solar panels and that kind of th and that kind of thing. I don't think everybody will be solar powered. There will probably be a few demographics where solar doesn't make sense, and it might make more sense to do either geothermal or nuclear wind power. But overall, yeah. Um, if you don't know what you were talking about, prove me wrong. What? Cybertrucks and lock the FSD price in for only one case. The best I will. Do. You got to make sense, Andres. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. Uh, was the call good? I mean, it wasn't much bad news other than just we haven't heard much about the Cybertruck in a while, which is concerning people. And there was a comment about 4680 volume production being 12 to 18 months away. And that has a lot of people worried about all the ramps of 4680 vehicles. Um, all my local solar companies wanted 18K while I got Tesla solar for 10 and a half K. Yeah. Tesla's definitely the cheapest, but from what I've heard, they've had like the worst communication problems out of everybody, which is why I would be hesitant dropping that kind of money on solar. Um, knowing that it's taken people many, many months to get them turned on and stuff. The sun can't always shine. Well, if the sun's not shining, we have bigger problems. <laughs> I mean, you can still get a lot of energy from solar even on cloudy days, but yeah. Um, that's why we have batteries, solar and batteries. Store the energy when it's cloudy. Go off the batteries when you're using more or at nighttime. And then when you got excess power in the daytime, charge up the batteries. Makes sense. Just a matter of scaling. But anyway, this has been fun. I've enjoyed chatting with you guys. And I'm sorry we didn't get too many exciting updates from Tesla today. But I'm still glad they're profitable. They're doing good. They're selling um, some of their crypto. And the Model S hopefully can be delivered next month. FSD beta button. We still don't know. But I hope it's this quarter. Cybertruck update. All that stuff. Uh, stay tuned. But thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate you all for watching. And I uh, hope you have an excellent rest of your day. Take care all. Bye-bye.